We would like to welcome everyone to our um, Board of Education meeting tonight. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to start with our Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, um, we'd like to welcome everyone that's here. Um, I see our uh, Tim Gilley from the transcript. We appreciate him coming and our um, classified and certified employee associations. We're grateful for them and their um, willingness at our district um, office staff, so thank you. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start off with Always the board's favorite part of board meeting is our district recognition. And this month we are recognizing Grantsville High. So we are going to turn the time over. I'm sure Mrs. Ake, oh, there you are. Going to turn, turn the time over to the principal, Ken Agard. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here tonight to uh, honor Grantsville High School and to celebrate our successes. I'd like to start first with um, our teacher of the, uh, of the year is Mr. Chisholm Nash. <laughs> Chisholm Nash has worked at Grantsville High School for 13 years. He is an exceptional teacher and is perfect candidate to be chosen as a Tula County School District Teacher of the Year. Chisholm creates his own games, activities, jokes, and other devices to not only engage students, but to ensure the students remember the information being taught. Students return to GHS years after they have been in Chisholm's class, and they still remember the grammar rules, themes from books, characters, etc., because Chisholm takes the time to create his own unique lesson. He makes sure that all the lessons are student-focused and fun. No matter how large of a class Chisholm has, he makes sure to take the time with each student. He makes them feel valued by creating fun nicknames, taking the time to work with them on, all individu on an individual level and remembering details they tell him about themselves that he can later recall and continue to connect with that student. Chisholm is also diligent in sending out weekly emails to ensure that parents and students are informed about updates, upcoming assignments, grades, etc. Every parent and student knows exactly what to expect from Chisholm. They know that Chisholm will have grades updated daily and that he will send out missing assignments and, date and updates every Friday. Students frequently report that Chisholm is an incredible listener and advocate for students. They say he actively listens to them in a way that makes them feel valued and heard, and they know that, they, that his care for them is genuine. His ability to connect with students instills respect, and because those students respect Chisholm and know that he is gen genuine in all he does, they want, they want, to, inspire to, be, they want to inspire higher. Because he deeply cares for his students, students feel comfortable asking Chisholm for help, and they know that if they make mistakes, he will always allow them to revise in order to continue learning and growing. Chisholm also likes to simplify learning. Assignments don't need to be complex to make students learn, and Chisholm breaks things down for students so that they learn complex topics in bite-sized portions, and his students flourish with this simplicity. Instead of feeling overwhelmed and frustrated, they feel encouraged and proud of their abilities, each encourages, which encourages all students to continue striving for excellence. Chisholm comes to school at 6 a.m. every day to ensure his grades are updated and that he has time to give detailed feedback and to make, sh make himself available to students who need help. He also stays later than most. He volunteers his own time to chaperone dances and activities outside of the sign-up sheet. He spends countless hours planning and organizing activities and assemblies with student government, countless hours planning graduation, meeting with school board members, shopping for supplies, running the Dungeons and Dragons Club that, he has, signif that has significantly grown under his care proofreading materials for other teachers in other departments and helping new teachers with their own lesson planning. Chisholm makes learning fun. He is, pos he is positive and helps students grasp concepts by incorporating st students into his lessons. Chisholm is instrumental in implementing the race writing strategy at GHS. Students have learned this strategy and will use it throughout their career at GHS, college, and in the workplace. Chisholm col collaborates with and builds relationships with students, staff, and parents to create school culture of respect and success. He greets students at the door each class period, inviting them to class, making them feel welcome that they are important to him. Chisholm's charisma and fun personality make learning fun. While walking down the hallway at school, two boys were walking and talking. One boy stated how excited he was to go to class. His friend asked, what class? The boy replied, Mr. Nash, he's my favorite teacher. I love his class. 
Students feel drawn to Mr. Nash because they know he cares about them. A senior stu student stated that she had Mr. Nash 10th period. It was the only class she had on white day at the school. She stated that she wouldn't have anyone else as her teacher but him in her last year at GHS. Chisholm gives all, gives all students the opportunity to excel in his classroom. He encourages them to do their best and gives them the ample time to redo work and turn it in for credit. He cares about each student and they know it is their responsibility to achieve excellence because of his support. So. Chisholm, will you introduce your family? Uh, so, right, right over here, there's my wife, and she's right there in the black coat. And then there's my sister, Chelsea, who's also a teacher. And then next to her is my son, Owen, who's a sophomore at uh, Twilla High. And then my uh, son, Cooper, who is in the fifth grade at uh, North Lake, and he just suffered through maturation today. <laughs> and because it was the ACT test, I couldn't go, so my wife had to uh, suffer through it as well. So, yeah, so, yeah a lot of fun. All right, thank you very much. The next person that we would like to honor is Kelly Morgan. Kelly is our uh, classified support person, and she has a dedicated, is a dedicated work-based learning coordinator at Grantsville High School. She boasts an impressive tenure of over 20 years as an integral member of, of the GHS staff. Kelly's unwavering commitment revolves around providing students with invaluable opportunities to explore diverse career paths during their, inform their formative years. Her proactive approach commences as early as the fourth grade, where she orchestrates the Kids Marketplace activity, allowing all Grantsville students to delve into the realms of various career and education paths. Throughout this, the student's educational journey, Kelly maintains a continuous connection with them. At Grantsville Junior High, Kelly guides them in exploring the array of CTE courses offered at Grantsville High, helping them to make more informed academic decisions. Once students reach high school, Kelly persists in broadening their horizons, equipping them with the skills needed to navigate the challenges of the workforce by leading the CTA, CTE internship class. Kelly actively mentors students eager to participate in CT internships and helps establish vital connections between academic knowledge and the real, work, real working world. Her efforts center around building relationships with local industries and community partners. This has been instrumental in, in linking students to relevant job sites. As the work-based uh, learning coordinator, Kelly strives to prepare the future workplace for our, for our local community. Kelly also provides opportunities for students to attend healthcare and she tech field trips where the real world application events for our students to extend their knowledge and learn about various career opportunities. Kelly is the only work-based coordinator in the district that provides a career fair for her students at the school. She spends countless hours contacting employers to come to our school and present their information to our students. She spends time at the junior high promoting lunch and learn sessions for incoming students to learn about opportunities at our school and career students can explore. Kelly supports GHS by volunteering to help whenever, when, wherever and whenever it is needed. She helps with football games, outside events as a site coordinator, and any event at the school. She also supports the counseling office by helping them with whatever is needed. Kelly has passion for her job as an advocate for students. She wants to help them be successful at GHS, at college, and in the workforce. Kelly is instrumental in guiding students to a pathway that will help them in their future goals and endeavors. Grantsville High School continually increases our pathway recipients each year due to Kelly's diligence, encourage students to work hard and do their very best.
Orlando. Roy says off work early and has to go back early. Okay. My son, Kevin, my daughter, Michelle, drove in from Salt Lake, and my daughter-in-law, Catalina, who drove in from Salt Lake. All right, next we have Corey Mondragon. He is our Volunteer of the Year. Corey is an alumnus of Grantsville High School. He has been a dedicated supporter of Grantsville High School Athletics since he graduated. Corey is the man behind the camera at our sporting events. He serves our students by taking pictures of our athletic teams, including our band, cheer, and drill team. His passion for photography and GHS drives Corey to create lasting memories with his photos and film. He donates his time going to home and away games to support our students, even though he does not have a student at GHS. In the past, Corey has been a volunteer coach while his children were active in sports in the community and has followed our students, cheering them on and filming them through their high school memories. Corey absolutely loves our students at GHS. He loves being on the field, on the mat, or on the court, capturing the moments and memories of our students. It is our privilege to honor Corey Mondragon as a Volunteer of the Year at GHS. through me going to all these games and stuff and she, she travels with me too sometimes so I appreciate her uh, my dad JR my mom Linda uh, my sister Jenny my son Brevin my brother Kelly and my brother-in-law Troy um, all from Grantsville so. all right next up we have Hadley Lund she has been chosen as our student of the month Hadley is a 10th grade student at GHS. Hadley is an outstanding student and person. She works hard in the classroom maintaining a 3.889 grade point average. She always goes to class on time, prepared to work and participates in class. She is responsible and shows compassion to everyone she encounters. She is willing to go above and beyond in everything she does. Hadley works hard and is diligent in being involved in extracurricular activities that include but, include but are not limited to swimming and the future farmers of America. Hadley willingly accepts leadership responsibilities for her FFA activities and completes those responsibility with exactness. Hadley is good at seeing what needs to be done without ever being asked or assigned. She jumps in and works hard in all that she does. From Holly Johnson, her agricultural education advisor, <clears throat> Hadley is one of my favorite students to visit in the summertime to check on her FFA project. She takes a lot of pride in her work and runs a very tidy ship. She raises lambs to show at the Tooele County Livestock Show and does it right. A great quality that Hadley has is her ability to recognize and show appreciation to those who help and support her. She gives a lot of credit to her support team for her success. She's a friend to everyone, always helps others around her feel included, and aids, aids her peers when they are struggling. Hadley is an excellent role model and is a student who shines brightly in the classroom and in extracurricular activities. Congratulations, Hadley. This is a well-deserved award. Thank you. Okay, next I'd let, we want to entertain you with these um, two beautiful girls that we brought from our school, Haley Broderick and Chelsea Bodell. Um, so if you guys want to come up. <laughs> They've got their cheerleading outfits on because they have to go back to the volleyball, we have a boys volleyball game tonight. But these beautiful girls, they are so talented. They are, of course, cheerleaders and they're involved in our student government and extracurricular activities. And they're going to be singing Bubbly by Callie. Colby Calais. Colby Calais. <laughs> okay, so we're going to turn this around. Okay. Ooh. Cool. Awesome. Oh man. 
in my toes and I crinkle my nose wherever it goes I always know that you make me smile please stay for a while now just take your time wherever you go the rain is falling on my window pane but we are hiding in a safer place undercover staying dry and warm give me feelings that I adore they start in my toes Crinkle my nose wherever it goes. I always know that you make me smile. Please stay for a while now. Just take your time wherever you go. What am I gonna say when you make me feel this way? I just Starts in my toes, makes me crinkle my nose Wherever it goes, I always know That you make me smile, please stay for a while now Just take your time, wherever you go like a child now cause every time you hold me in your arms I'm comfortable enough to feel you warm to start in my soul and I lose all control when you kiss my nose the feeling shows cause you make me smile baby just take your time now holding me tight Do you guys want to do another one? <laughs> you guys, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Grantsville High School. That was great. Oh, back to the agenda. All right, I was thinking we'd have get another concert, like a full-on concert tonight. Um, all righty, thank you very much. We will move into our pat patron comment portion of our board meeting. Um, we would love to have everyone stay, but we also know this is a great time to exit if you're only, if, if you uh, need to leave. Um, we're so grateful for all of you coming and um, anyways, while people are exiting, I'm going to go ahead and read our, my statement that I read, not my statement, statement I read before public comment, just to remind everyone. Um, Everyone that has signed up will have three minutes to speak and a total of 30 minutes for all comments. Those speaking will be called in the order they signed up for. Once your name is called, please come forward and state your name and what your topic is about. All comments are recorded, so please speak clearly into the microphone. Once the timer goes off, we ask that you return to your seat. Please refrain from using profane language, making threats, or revealing confidential student or staff information. We want to remind you that the board is here to listen during public comment, but we will not respond to any comments or questions you have. Any additional information can be sent through board email. So I will go ahead. Um, our first um, name on here is Spot SD. And then our next one is uh, waiting in the wings is Lisa from TEA. Good evening. 
Spots is here today with our first annual Fill the Boardroom event. Woo -woo. We have planned this night in effort for you as school board to see classified employees and for the hardworking employees to see what you as a school board do monthly. As we strive for excellence in education, it's crucial to acknowledge the significant contributions of every employee, including those who often work behind the scenes. Our classified staff plays a pivotal role in maintaining the smooth operation of our schools. From custodians who ensure clean and safe environments for learning, to secretaries who provide vital support to teachers and students, every individual contributes to a cohesive functioning of our schools. We thank you for the time and effort you put into making hard decisions and creating cultures that allow all employees to be celebrated and cherished, and continuing to ensure that our schools continue to thrive and excel. Thank you. Thank you very much. After Lisa, Shannon Heaps. Okay, I'm gonna keep Spot SD up with us. Okay, hi guys. Uh, this is gonna be short. So we, you guys, and all of us, ma'am, we've made it through three quarters of this year. I can't believe it. Isn't that amazing? Seriously, it's fourth term. And you know what, four years ago, we were out with COVID. <laughs> Sometimes I wish we were done. All right, just kidding. We navigated legislative season this year. We've made it through. That's another win. Um, we've been focusing on the instructional framework in our schools. Yeah. And we've been working hard, hand in hand with the school district every day this year. And we've been working hard every day with SPOT SD. And so we want to take a moment to celebrate school board and to say thank you to you guys for school board appreciation. Thanks for all you guys do. After Shannon, Mary Jo Hammond. My name is Shannon Heaps. I teach second grade at Sterling Elementary. Um, I just come to share my, uh, my thoughts and some facts about teaching in a portable at an elementary school level. Um, I just went ahead and made a list of pros and cons. I found for myself, I found one pro <laughs> to being in a portable this year, and that's isolation. I've never been more productive on a Wednesday afternoon <laughs> than I have been <laughs> in a portable. But my list of cons start out with the isolation. Um, I feel like I'm not as much as a part of the team as I have been in the past. Our classes have been forgotten for fire drills, which leads to my next uh, con, our smoke alarms. Don't work in the portable. We don't have smoke alarms. Uh, we have a lack of bathrooms for the teachers and students. The kids have been known to pee and or poop their pants out there. Uh, mind you, it's second grade. They're seven and eight-year-olds that are in a portable. Um, the ramp is very slippery when wet, icy, and snowy. Our floors get vacuumed once in a while. Our trash cans get emptied once in a while. There are no cupboards, no storage space, except for what I have brought in. Um, let's see. Uh, water drips right in front of our door then freezes on the ground or on the 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 ramp the, uh, the metal ramp and um, makes it hard for us to even open our doors uh, we feel unsafe out there we feel like if there were a gunman god forbid uh, that wanted to just shoot as many people as they could we are the least secure out in the portable um, there is a loss of learning. We ha I have a peephole in my door, and every time somebody wants to come into our room, come get special ed kids, or um, 
our paras that come to get the kids for their interventions or whatever, they have to knock on the door, then I have to go lo look through the peephole to make sure that it's somebody safe coming into my room. And so every time I have to stop and do that, that's a loss of learning and we have to get back on a track again. And that could be several times. We have an hour protected time for literacy, but I am answering that door several times during that hour. Um, and then uh, the last thing on my list is no uh, sink or fountain. Thank you. Thank you. After Mary Jo, Danielle uh, Giard. Sorry if I got that wrong. I apologize. Hi, Dr. Ernst and members of the board. My name is Mary Jo Hammond and I'm from Sterling Elementary. I am a life skills teacher there and so I have the most significantly disabled students in my classroom. The first thing I wanted to talk about is the PowerPoint that you guys have seen in the past and it lists all the special classrooms in the district. But Sterling was accidentally left off of that. So when you're figuring out numbers, you have to think about two life skills classes that are at Sterling Elementary. In addition to those two life skills classes that are at Sterling Elementary, we have two special ed classrooms and a literacy room. So that's five classrooms that have, a, that have 18 students amongst the five classrooms. So that's 150 students room. You know, it's, it's the room for 150 students and is only occupied by 18. So I want you to keep that in mind while you're thinking of those boundaries. Have you been to our school and looked at how full we really are? So we have no room. There's no space available. Um, like other schools, we are doing our progress monitoring, our interventions, our benchmark testing, and such in the hallway due to lack of space availability. Um, our interventions are also being held in the teacher's lounge. This is not an optimal meeting, uh, optimal for meeting our students' needs, especially if we're doing interventions to bring them up to benchmark levels in their testing scores. Um, it doesn't guarantee that we are getting the best work with all of the transitions that are happening around the students as they are being assessed or instructed. Many of these students are on IEPs, and I'm sure a lot of them have accommodations that state that they need minimized distractions. When you're in the hallway getting your instruction, that's not a minimized distraction situation. Nor is it, I mean, I know I did my DLM testing in the hallway last year. That's not minimized distractions, because that's the only room they had. In order for us to increase our, name, our numbers, as every one of the boundaries that are presented show, um, we need additional portables. Um, that costs a lot of money to prepare the land, to transport them, to level them, to connect them to electricity, to attach the fire alarm system, as Mrs. Heap stated, is not connected currently, which is a safety hazard, to finish the skirting, to paint, and to prepare it for the students. Right now, our district budget is on life support, so much so it needs a crash cart. Sadly, we don't have the budget to buy one. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> so, um, of course I lost my spot. Um, so I just want you to keep that in mind when you're looking at that. Our district, our county is the largest growing county in all of Utah. In, from 2012 to 2022, we grew by 7,000 students. 7,000. So think of that for next year. Where are they going to go? After Danielle, Trish Williams. Hi, my name's Danielle Giard, and I work in the behavior department. I'm not really a public speaker, but we're going to give it a go. Um, <clears throat> I want you guys to please think back to when you were in grade school and what your classroom environment looked like. Uh, was a memory that came to mind one of violence or fear for your safety? Because unfortunately, this is a daily environment for many of our Tula County School District students. Uh, students are able to destroy classrooms and perform Physical violence acts with little to no consequences on a daily basis. 
Uh, and I just wanted to ask you guys, when did we decide that excessive uh, violence uh, is the acceptable norm? Um, and why did we adopt the anything to keep the student at school policy? Um, why are we allowing these students to rob the majority of the right to learn and the right to learn in a safe environment? Additionally, if you would like to have us adopt the anything to keep the student at school policy, uh, why is there not a designated safe area available in each school to bring these students who are escalated? Uh, calm rooms or Zen dens are, are pivotal for us to help us keep the students, teachers, and support staff safe. Um, please help us make these changes. Um, as educators, we are supposed to be team students. Our roles extend beyond the classroom and impact them lifelong. Um, by us not enforcing rules, teaching accountability and consequences, we are setting our students up for failure as adults. Thank you for listening. Hold on, after Trish, uh, Willard, Richard Willard, Willard Richard, sorry. <laughs> but after Trisha, sorry. Um, so my name's Trish Williams. I do behavior tech um, with the Tooele County School District, which I absolutely love. But I am coming before you this evening to express the deep concerns for myself and my colleagues, the behavior techs. Uh, regarding recent changes in our pay structure and the challenges we face in our daily work environment. Every morning as we prepare to enter our workplaces, we are filled with a sense of apprehension and uncertainty. We never know if or how badly we will be abused or physically assaulted by the students we work with. The constant state of fight or flight is taking a toll on our mental and physical well-being. Adding to our stress is the recent decision to revoke our equal pay if we miss more than five days of work, regardless of the reasons for our absence. This policy puts us in an impossible position as we often do not receive enough hours to qualify for insurance coverage, leaving us vulnerable and without support in times of illness and injury. Furthermore, it is disheartening to see that while the frontline workers dealing with these challenging behaviors are struggling to make ends meet, others in our district are receiving full-time pay and benefits without seeming to fulfill their roles effectively. I have personally witnessed a counselor who has not engaged with students in therapy sessions and a psychologist who is rare, rarely present in the school and keeps wanting more data, yet both receive full compensation. In contrast, we the behavior techs are actively engaged with students who have experienced severe trauma and exhibit challenging behaviors. We work tirelessly to support these students, often putting ourselves at risk in the process. The lack of support and recognition from the school board, the superintendent and others in leadership positions is disheartening and demoralizing. I challenge our superintendent who is adept at making videos to spend a day with us. Let's make a video that truly captures the challenges we face and the importance of our work. We are not asking for special treatment, only fair treatment. We ask that you, re you reconsider the recent changes to our, to our pay structure, provide us with the support and resources. We need to do our jobs effectively and show us the appreciation and gratitude that we deserve for the work we do in, or we do day in and day out. I do appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us. Thank you. And then in the wings is Lori, Lori Fellner. Hope I got that right. Come on. No, you're up. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Is it Willard Richard? Okay, perfect. Thank you. My name is Willard Richard, and my wife is a bus driver. And I used to drive bus, and um, I retired after five years. 
Uh, I had a uh, triple bypass. I uh, figured I didn't need that kind of stress on my height. But uh, I'm here today to, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know the formality. I've never done this before. But uh, it, it came to our attention that there was a, uh, was it a $50 million deficit or something? And um, that there was going to be a discussion of, of what to do uh, concerning that. Um, you know, we, everybody makes mistakes. And uh, I think uh, you admitted that it was on your part. Is that correct? Okay. So my question is, are you going to penalize the people under you? Or is it going to be from the top down? You know, as far as uh, cutting pay, I think that was one of the things that you talked about, or cutting some jobs. Um, I don't know if you came to the decision yet, uh, but I think you, it ought to be considered that uh, everyone from the top down, if, if you're going to cut the pay of those, the people under you, then it needs to come from the top down so that everybody feels it, so that it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's about being, uh, doing what's right, I feel. And that's all I have to say. God bless you. After Lori, Brandon Yusio. Hello, my name is Lori Fellner, and I'm the parent liaison at Sterling Elementary. I am here today to be a voice for the parents, students, and staff regarding the overpopulation at Sterling Elementary. As a parent and student advocate, my role is to connect parents with community resources and ensure students receive support and can learn in a school environment they are capable of thriving in. <coughs> Sterling currently has a population of 856 students, the highest population of all elementaries in our district. Though the numbers on paper show we have space to add additional students, I am here today to give you a brief snapshot of what overpopulation at Sterling looks like. On top of our 38 regular ed classrooms that are at capacity, we also have our literacy classroom that serves approximately 713 students between progress monitoring and interventions. Some interventions have to be done in the hallways and faculty room as there isn't enough dedicated space. One upper and one lower sped room, both at capacity. We are already at two times the capacity of most other sped departments in the district. Two life skill classrooms at capacity. Our computer teacher pushes into classrooms as the computer labs are now being used for classrooms. <coughs> Our music teacher works in the community room, which takes away from the space needed for any private conferences or meetings that need to be held. Our second grade DLI classrooms are in portables, and these students are using a staff key card to access the building throughout the day, causing a security risk. Limited time for counseling privacy, as the counseling room is now used for IEP conferences. The number of identified high-risk students needing either group or individual counseling is 115. One of our refocus offices is currently used for students who need a quiet, safe space to de-escalate. Two preschool classrooms for 75 preschoolers. These students weren't included in the project population options. This means that the total students for 1A through 2C would be 919 <coughs> students instead of 844. And 3A and 3B would be 997 rather than 922. There is also extreme traffic congestion during drop-off and pickup. On top of our lack of space, we also deal with da daily with an overwhelming number of classroom incidents and office referrals. Sterling is ranked number one in school behaviors, more than double any other school in the district, including elementary, junior, and high schools. So far this school year, we have had 1,068 office referrals and 1,120 classroom incidents. These incidents overwhelm staff and admin with the responsibility of de-escalating situations to protect the classroom environment, both physically and academically. Adding additional students would only increase those incidents and the overwhelm on Sterling's population as a whole. I hope my message has given you a glimpse into the world that we're living in at Sterling. Thank you. And then
Well, I'm, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> there are two things that I want to speak about tonight, and they're both the things that are the elephants in the rooms. It's the budget and the boundaries. We have, we've heard a lot about both of those tonight already. Um, when it comes to the budget, I, wanted, I want to say here now that every parent that I have spoken to about the details of ending the relationship with my tech high has supported the board's decisions. None of us are thrilled that we, there's between 20 and $50 million that we're going to have to make up, but it was the moral decision. And I wanted to make sure that that was on the record that parents support that. But budget is, budget is important to any organization. Uh, there are so many, so many places that are needing of, of that budget here in this district. And the boundaries that we are talking about fall right into that. Every boundary discussion tonight and almost every school crowding discussion tonight has been because schools feel crowded. And as we look, as we look at that, I'll, I would really encourage the board to strongly consider option 1A in the boundary proposal out of all the options given for budgetary reasons. Uh, last, in the last budget hearing meeting, it seemed like we talked, or we, you talked about budget 1A, or boundary 1A and boundary 1B as kind of what you were leaning towards. Option 1B doesn't make sense financially. It doesn't make sense to drive more buses. It doesn't make sense to have the logistics not follow those clear boundaries, resulting in more time for students in the buses, more gas spent, more bus routes. Uh, as we, I'm, I'm sure running out of time here, but the overcrowding that we're feeling seems to be space and, and not classroom size and not staff as much as it is that we're having to do interventions in the hallways and the faculty rooms. Uh, Over, Overlake Elementary is facing the same thing uh, with full day kindergarten taking up two extra classrooms there and, uh, and all of these different things. It's gonna be a tough fix, but as, as the board has phased out DLI in many of the schools, as those grade levels go away, many of the grades that have four teachers can be consolidated down to three classes per grade as the class levels normalize. Uh, making the fewest amount of changes to class sizes and staff right now, while it might be painful, might be the best thing to do while we're figuring out how to make up that budget difference. And then also it's just overly, when it comes to uh, these boundaries, option 1A, I'll be honest, changes Overlake the least. And Overlake has been hurt no swimming program at Desert Peak, no uh, DLI anymore, and taking those West Erta, West Erta kids would change the school dramatically. I'm out of time, so I have a lot more to say, as I'm sure you all know, but I, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for coming and um, um, commenting. We, I appreciate, well, I think we as a board all appreciate it. Um, Okay, we are gonna move on to number five, our consent calendar. I'm looking for a motion, Scott. Could we remove item 5.9, thank you, Elizabeth, from the consent. Uh, so I would motion we approve the consent items with the exception of 5.9 as presented. Moved by Scott, seconded by Bob to approve consent items except for 5.9, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 5.9. So regarding 5.9, as I had an opportunity to review the calendar as it was presented, and I'm sorry, it's not coming up. 5.9 is the oh. Board of Education meeting schedule for those of you that So uh, there was just a couple notes. Um, the board meeting that is on November the 26th, currently is proposed, uh, would f actually technically fall in, in Thanksgiving break uh, since that Thanksgiving break starts at the end, uh, conclusion of school on the night, the day of the 26th. So I would just suggest, uh, particularly I noticed that the, the November meetings get kind of, I don't know, get weird around the holidays and also around elections. So I would just propose that we remove that from the, the calendar. 
Um, and I think there was some conversation about August the 13th, but I'm not sure, Jackie, or maybe you had a chance to talk to another board member on that one. Yeah. Let me clarify really quick on the 26th. Um, as Bob and I were talking with Jackie, just so the board knows, um, of course, board meetings are important. This is a work session. If you've noticed, the last few months we've really tried to... Um, make those work sessions effective with director reports the way they've been handled so we could add if there's a director report in November we could add some of those in October or into uh, January or February so anyways I, f I feel fine with that and I know Bob does so anyways that's just an explanation on November uh, Elizabeth had a call comment about August 13th so August 13th is the first day of school so I propose that we have the meeting on August 20th because everyone is exhausted the night of the first day of school <laughs> so um, my only concern with that is there's a potential uh, truth and taxation that has to happen within a certain period we might need to go to the other direction to the sixth, and I'm not sure the dates unless we want to put it to be determined. No, uh, does that make sense, Mr. Reynolds? You can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we have we have we have to do the truth and taxation at least two weeks after the notices go out, and those go out the last week of July. So if we move to the sixth, that would be too soon. The twentieth actually gives us a little bit more buffer. Okay, and we don't have a work session in August. I was worried about two meetings back to back, Jackie. I, are you talking about if we do a truth and taxation on the 27th? 20th. Well, the 20th would be the board meeting. We do we do, do that as the same night? So that would just be one. Okay. So with that in mind, I'll propose, I would motion that we adopt uh, the district, uh, the board of education meeting calendar for the 24-25 school year as presented with the exception of the August meeting being on August 20th instead of the 13th and also no meeting on November the 26th. Second. It's been moved by Scott, seconded by Elizabeth to adopt the Board of Education meeting schedule 24-25, except for move the August 13th meeting to August 20th and discard the November 26th work meeting. I need more discuss, excuse me, discussion to that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, our first action item is the elementary boundary realignment. I know that a few board members were talking um, down in Dr. Ernst's superintendent report. I feel like there's good information uh, in there that we might want to discuss before doing the elementary boundary but in order to do that we need a motion i don't know if anyone's appetites for that i i don't i'll make a motion. okay yeah i move that we move item 7.1 superintendent's report mid-year budget update um up in the calendar to before 6.1 do i have a second not calendar schedule for tonight agenda agenda but we're, we're, you're moving it till right now, right? Yeah, that would be now. <laughs> Before 6.1. Oh, so 6.1 oh, is elementary uh, boundary realignment, I'll yeah. Move moved by Emily, seconded by Julia to move uh, item 7.1 to before 6.1. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We're going to go ahead and go to 7.1. Dr. Ernst. Yes, thank you. So um, before we get to budget stuff, I'll do my uh, regular superintendent update. Uh, and I think Lark's going to control the, the big board. I don't know. Maybe someone over there. They'll... Uh, so this, uh, this part has to do with concerning my goals, my superintendent goals for, for this month. It's uh, goal one. And... Uh, I guess I have it on my computer also. I don't have to keep looking behind me. One thing, um, we have a lot of initiatives that we do in the district. One of them that we started last year training our administrators on was the instructional framework. And then administrators have been training teachers on it this year for, for full implementation. Uh, one thing, I think the instructional framework sometimes gets a little bit of uh, confusion 
in people thinking that the instructional framework is a lesson plan template, and it's not. It is a it's a it's a framework that can be imposed over any lesson, and there's certain aspects of the framework necessary things that we want to see in every lesson being taught throughout the school district. Um, and our next slide shows a, a definition. The instructional framework is a structure for sound daily instruction to deliberately support learner success. The framework provides um, Tooele County School District with a common language and model for instructional practice. So that's the next slide, Lark. There you go. We're we're learning to communicate far away here. So um, the nice thing about the framework is that it uh, it doesn't matter what class you're in. There's good things uh, in the framework that we should always see. The instructional leader's role in the framework is to, number one, make sure that teachers understand it, train and coach to the framework, and make sure that it is, it is implemented in their school. One thing that I ask our administrators to do is by April 30th to have a short one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with each teacher in their building to talk to them about the instructional framework. Basically asking them, how do you feel about it? Are you using it? And I really don't care what the answer is. I'm actually okay if a teacher says, as a matter of fact, if a teacher is not using it, I prefer them to say, I don't use it. Because then the principal can say, oh, why don't you use it? And then it, an opportunity for a dialogue. I don't use it because I don't know how it fits into my class or for these other reasons. I want all of our teachers to use it because we know it's, uh, it, there's research behind it that says that it matters and it'll make a difference in, in students' lives. But I want those principals to know what's happening in their building. And if it's not taking place, let's solve those problems. And if it is, uh, occurring if teachers are using it then let's celebrate it as we move forward uh, this year we are training our principals on what is called a guaranteed and viable curriculum so that's something you're probably going to hear a lot about in the coming year so I want to give you a definition and I'll just read it you can follow along a guaranteed and viable curriculum is a scope and sequence map that ensures two things number one that every student in is, is accounted for sorry every standard is accounted for and that every child will be taught that standard that's the guaranteed part that we're going to teach our students what is most valuable and that the curriculum can realistically be taught in the time available for the course that's the viable part and of course we're going to rely heavily upon our teachers because they're the ones that have to implement this uh, during the day there are multiple curriculums um, around that are not viable. There's just too much. The teacher can't get it all in the day or in the year. And so when we have these discussions, we're gonna have to figure that out and make it viable. So that's something that our, our principals are being trained on now. They will introduce that to their teachers next school year. And then the slide you see now, that is a, just a little quote that continuous improvement is making small incremental changes that add up, add up to significant results based on deliberate observation of current processes. I am not under the illusion that we will change our school district in a month or even a year, but I am convinced that if we make small incremental changes for the better, it will have a positive impact on our school district and our students. Okay. So that's the first part. Now probably the part everyone wants to hear. Don't go to the next slide yet, Lark. <laughs> um, well, actually, yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's watch this. This is the part I heard today that people thought I was hiding something. So this is what I was hiding. Gene, we have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which were meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. And the ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. 
Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs handed us this one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this. Using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Maybe get some coffee going too, someone. The reason I share this clip is because that illustrates exactly the charge that I gave the executive staff as we tried to solve this budget problem. This is not a, a problem uh, that we anticipated. It's one that was handed to us by uh, the state, uh, but it's our job to figure out how to get the round peg in the square hole or whichever way they said it there. Um, so part of that was the challenge that I gave the executive staff is let's come up with a plan that does not impact positions or current pay. My charge was that everyone employed at Tooele County School District right now today, let's find a plan that guarantees them a job next year. My other charge was that if someone is making whatever salary they're making this year, let's try to find a plan that guarantees that salary for next year. And then my third thing was, let's try to find a plan that does not unnecessarily burden our taxpayers. Now that's our starting point. That's, that's, what, that's, that's our moonshot. That's what we're trying to do. Is it all possible? Um, we'll see. Um, I'll, I'll present a plan and, and then we can, you can discuss and uh, we can go from there. But that was the starting point. That is what, what we wanted to do. And I think that's important that everyone understands what those goals are when we started. A few updates from the legislative session. Um, legislators have given the Utah State Board of Education authorization to give us up to $10 million to mitigate the mid-year budget adjustment. I, it is up to is what it says in the, the package. I will, can tell you and board members, you know this, that uh, last Friday at the committee meeting, the audit committee or the budget committee for the state office, they approved $10 million. Now it'll go to the, the full board of, for USBE. Uh, that vote will take place April 4th. Uh, I've heard nothing that lead, leads me to think that we will receive anything less than the 10 million. Uh, it was a unanimous vote. I, I think that will carry uh, to the full board on uh, April 4th. Also, we know from in the legislative session, we were given a 5% WPU increase. That's a $4.8 million, $4 million uh, increase. The $10 million, you maybe can't see it on the screen if you're in the room, the $10 million helps us cover the current school year, kind of the shortfall we're at. So that's gonna be used in the current fiscal year. The 4.8 uh, is ongoing money in the WPU. That helps us address inflation and ongoing operating costs for the school district. With all that being said, um, if, if we look at our money, our school district is $12.8 million short in ongoing revenues to cover current salaries and benefits in our base budget. So that's what we have to solve. So we considered a lot of stuff. So next slide. Certainly if we wanted, and it's still a, a, an option, we can reduce staff and programs. Um, we would have to be very precise about what staff or what programs we, we were, were to reduce. I can tell you that I believe that every staff member currently employed in the school district is needed and so is every program. Uh, some are more vital than others, but the programs, I mean, not the staff, but some programs are more vital than others just because of their scope, maybe the number of students they reach or the, or the specificity of the program. Um, when we talk about reducing staff, uh, the first thing I would reduce is all the staff that we don't have, meaning we have uh, multiple open jobs that have been open all year uh, that we can't staff. So. Uh, anyhow, that, that is an option. 
Another option we, we could do is to increase taxes uh, and pass this shortfall onto the taxpayers. If we were to increase taxes $364 a year or $330 a month, three, $30, what did I say? 300, not 300. 364 a year or $30 and 30 cents a month um, for a house or 662 for a business, that's a house valued at $462,000, that would meet our shortfall. That would produce $12 million. An increase of a little bit less than that, 227 a year uh, and 413 on a business produces $8 million. Uh, and we can talk later about uh, that lower number if, if you want. So I share those with you as those are options. Now, before I get too far into the next slide, I know there's going to be a lot of questions about this. Um, so hopefully we can let me get through and let Lar get through, and then you can ask those questions. Couple things of note. I need to first off excuse Dr. Ham, who's not here t tonight. He's uh, celebrating an anniversary. I don't know how many years, but a lot of years. Um, but he uh, and Lark and I kind of put this together, uh, put this presentation together. We did it together. Lark, Mr. Reynolds, our business administrator, he is the architect of this. Um, I want to give credit where uh, credit's due. And so uh, we've been working on this. As a matter of fact, we made changes just this afternoon as we continue to talk about different things. So number one, we can use the $40 million that we have in capital reserves. You'll notice the asterisk is next to that. I'll explain the asterisk in a bit. Um, this $40 million partially covers the remaining balance for new construction. Uh, that new construction actually includes uh, 20 Wells Elementary, Desert Peak High School, and uh, Stansbury Park Junior High. Really, it is Stansbury Park Junior High that we would be short of because that's the, the, the last project, yeah. So $40 million out of capital reserves partially covers the remaining. Uh, issuing a $50 million uh, lease revenue bond or MBA bond makes up the additional 10 million we need to cover the construction. 40 million of that remains. So just keep that in the back of your head. Another thing that we do, and this is a kind of a tricky one to explain. So when we get taxes in from uh, our, our, the, the county and the city, when we get all those taxes in, or we can put those in multiple different categories. It's four different categories. Two of those categories, one is the general fund and one is the capital local levy. So each of those items, we can uh, put a certain percentage of money into those areas. And it doesn't matter how much or how little we put in, as long as the total tax number at the bottom the sum is all the same. So if we do for easy, and, and it's not this easy, but if it was 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, that equals 8%. As long as that 8% stays the same, it doesn't matter if we do 0.53, 2.5, or, or zero, whatever it equals, as long as it always equals eight, we're allowed to do that. So If we increase the general fund levies by $11.3 million and also the $1.5 million we get from additional taxes, it comes from vehicles and late fees and several different taxes that, that come to us, that gives us $12.8 million ongoing. This fixes the ongoing shortage. If we make that change, then instantly that, that ongoing deficit that we have is gone. Where do we get the 11.3 million? We take it out of the capital local levy. So we just change those percentages in capital, dial it back and dial it up in the general fund. It's all the same money. It just goes into a different account. That, and that's something that we're allowed to do. Number four is to transfer the $40 million remaining from MBA bonds into capital reserves. This will fund capital for about the next four years. Uh, that, that's our estimate. Notice the asterisk. This comes back into the first asterisk. You could ask, well, couldn't you just take the $50 million from the MBA bond to cover the construction? Yes, you can. And then we could use the $40 million in capital reserves 
to, uh, to fund the capital. It's just two ways of looking at the same problem. So even though you look at this and, and there are different options, we can kind of slide these things around a little bit on, on those two items, number, number one and number four. Number five is to institute small incremental tax raises over multiple years. This has actually been the policy of Tooele County School District for many years is to, uh, we would rather give our constituents small annual tax raises rather than no tax, tax increases for say five or six years and then they have a massive one on year seven. And so those small incremental tax raises um, will help us fund some of our accounts. We'll put it all into the capital local levy um, and it also helps our taxpayers because that amount of tax to them is smaller on an annual basis rather than a large increase. And then the, the number six item there is implement additional ongoing cost saving measures. Um, and there's several things we look at. You know, currently we are highly restricting travel. Um, we can also look at uh, adopt different uh, adoptions we have planned. Uh, how, how soon we uh, replace Chromebooks for our students, how often we replace uh, desktop computers for our teachers. Of course, there's give and take with all of that, uh, but as we, as we dial back some of those costs, then those are some of the sacrifices we have to make. We may have to put up with an, an older computer for an extra year, or an order, older set of textbooks for an extra year, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so, before we turn you loose to questions, uh, Mr. Reynolds is going to go over the mid-year and capital cash flow analysis. That is basically putting into spreadsheet and numbers what I just talked about. And then you can, when we get to questions, you can ask me, you can ask Mr. Reynolds, whoever that is. So Lark, all you. Thanks, Superintendent. Um, Sorry, you might have to turn around to actually see the spreadsheets when I, when I pull them up. But before I do that, I just wanted to say that, um, that this was something that we've been working on, as you know, over the past few months. Um, some of the things I'm going to show you, you may ask, well, why was it different a few months ago? Because we have been working on it. And, and I wanted to stress that, uh, that it, I felt like it is a plan that we're, we've been trying to f come up with a way to fix it. And, and what's being presented here happens to be, if we're gonna call this a plan, the, the inspiration that, that hit was a way that I felt was a best case scenario for our district. Now, um, we're trying to, of course, um, explain it to you and convince it in that way. But as I know as you read through the PowerPoint, you're probably wondering, where did these numbers come from? And so that's what I wanted to walk through. I, mean, I think superintendent, when we wrote it, you gotta understand that um, we had the numbers in front of us and we were working with the answer backwards and some of you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? So I'm gonna start with these spreadsheets so you can see um, if we were working forwards on the problem. The, the whole intent here is to fill a reservoir, if you can call that, to have enough uh, funds in our reservoir to uh, be able to get us through the, the tough time coming up. And the reason I point that, if you have this analogy of a reservoir and we're filling it, um, that, um, that's part of the reason we worked so diligently um, when we talk about the legislative process here. But first I wanna start with the question of the $50 million bond, which is important that you'll find out in the cash flow analysis that it all depends upon that, and I'll show you why. Um, but there's been some confusion. What does it mean if you have a $50 million bond that has to be attached to a, a piece of property? So in my analysis, I'm assuming it would be attached to the Stansbury Park Junior High School. Yes, we need 50 million to complete it. It's not just 10. Um, but let me show you why. Um, if you actually look at these numbers, this is something we've been tracking, a spreadsheet I've shared um, up there. But we, we were authorized to have $173.4 million um, from the election. And what year did we do that? 2020? 2019? I think it was 2020. Um, we were authorized to issue bonds up to that amount. Now, it actually, it actually was $170,000. If you're curious, we can accept 2% premium on it. That's how we get the 173.4. Um, at that time, we also committed to use $20,000, or sorry, $20 million of our capital reserves, 193. 
but we, we did not know the uh, escalation that was going to happen because or inflation, I will say, on construction projects. So down here you see the actual budgets that we currently have. Now the elementary is completed. That was a screaming deal we got for 22.3 million, if I round up. Um, high school, junior high under uh, contract right now. Bottom line, if you add all those up, we would have been $56 million short. So when you ask how can we issue bonds of $50 million, you can show that we, we're going to spend that on the, on the junior high school. It's, it's, it's a given. Um, so with that knowledge, I wanted to show you the ongoing expenses really quick. I call this uh, the analysis that we shared last month. Um, and this is one you might ask, well, why was that 20 million or 27? I think actually it was 27 um, last month. And that's because we were in the middle of the legislative session fighting for every dollar we could get, right? That's what I want to talk about as far as filling that reserve to make sure we had enough to draw on. Um, if you actually look at ongoing salaries and benefits, um, and I take in our projected revenues from uh, current projected revenues based on our uh, WPUs this year, and we would be $12.8 million short in, uh, in salaries. And that's where we got into those scenarios that superintendent went over when we've looked at every option on the table. How can we, gener you know, how can, in theory, we generate $12.8 million ongoing revenues to help us, uh, to help us not, this would be the, as I call it, the home run where you, nobody has to worry about their job. For next year, their, their employment is, is safe. Uh, you don't know, have to work, look at RIFs and all the other options that were on the table, or pay reductions, I should say. Um, so with that, uh, that's the, the targeted number. Now, um, down below is where I came up with the numbers that you saw for uh, what that would be on an average household, um, the tax values. And that's what the public sees and deals with. As a matter of fact, I ran into uh, our county treasurer the other day, Mike Jensen, and, and he said, at least from the county perspective, I happened to ask him, because I'm just curious, you know, what's being said about Tula County School District out in the public? And at least at his level, what's coming to the county is they're worried about what is the property tax increase going to be. I think people realize, when I say that, that's the only thing we have control over, um, other than the legislative money that, that's handed out. We really don't have a lot of say in that. It's, it's handed out statewide. It kind of is what it is, but the one thing we have control over is our local property tax. And so that's what we considered in there in the home run. So that's where we came up with the numbers that superintendent shared with you. Now, if you're just curious, I use this as a, using this example, if we had to um, come up with that, this whole thing's driven on this, this formula here. So if I actually just come in and, and uh, let's see, I'm gonna add in this cell over here. Remember how we're gonna get 4.8 roughly for the, um, for the WPU increase. This is where those other, those lower tax numbers came from. That's as if every money, that new money was off the table and we still had to increase taxes. This is what it would be just to fill our ongoing expenses. This is to plug the hole that, that seems to be uh, leaking, uh, uh, or water's leaking out. So that's the analysis he showed you. So the plan to, uh, to use with flexibility in, in the tax levies, this plan, and the reason it's contingent upon it, so I gotta toggle between three, but is this cash flow analysis in here. Um, what I wanted to show you is, that's why I think it's important that if we were to issue MBA bonds, that we, I put in the full 50 in my analysis, saying that we have everything in that reservoir to make sure we have enough to carry us through the next few years. Um, now the logic in that is by being able to draw from those capital reserves and transfer them over to um, our ongoing needs, our general fund, where most of the salaries are paid for, um, the, the logic behind that is it buys you time. It buys you time to do these incrementally, not in one, the pressure to do it in one year to make up a huge deficit. And so in this analysis, I have uh, um, our current fund balance, which is the top part of this, and then I put in budgeted revenues and expenditures from year to year um, based on what we're currently doing. And uh, and it, the whole thing in my analysis here on, on fiscal year 24, it looks like we got a lot of money in there, but realize it's committed to finish the two schools that are currently under construction. And so um, the last thing I have, you maybe you've heard, but we're gonna, we have $30 million left to issue of that uh, 170 authorization. And so I built in that $30 million um, in, in this year, because we plan on doing that in June and actually receiving money for that. 
my assumption was at the same time we would go out for the $50 million that we've already adopted a, a reimbursement for and uh, have started the paperwork on that. So I have that $50 million in there to show how we would be. And then, of course, our expenditure projections throughout the year. So the bottom line, I'm just going to show you down here because this bottom line here shows me our ending fund balance. And uh, by doing this analysis, I'm showing you that what, I'm, what we were doing up above that I didn't show you, I'm sorry, is we were slowly increasing taxes. And if, you, if you're curious, I used the $100 estimate we used this year, considering that a smaller number, um, which generated roughly $3 million. So I had a $3 million increase over four years to build back up our capital reserve, if you're curious. That's, that's the thing that drives this analysis. But if I go up and delete the $50 million just to show you, and took that out. Uh, all right, hasn't recalculated yet. Don't know what happened. There we go. Um, you see that we are immediately negative. So the whole plan is based on you have to build up the reserves in capital, as the superintendent was talking about. And, uh, and that's where the 50 would come from. So if I undo that change there. Um, that's hence the 40 million that you had down there. Uh, I think if I actually took the 50 out, you saw the 10. That's where we were getting at. You need at least 10 to uh, finish the construction on the schools. But if you're going to do that, why not build up that reserve? Because you have the that's capacity to do that, to draw from over the next few years. We think that's a win-win for employees, for the district, and, and everything. So does that help explain it from the top down? I hope. I do want to remind the public really quickly, and I think it's been said multiple times, but just um, before the $50 million shortfall even was an issue back in November, um, if you'll remember, be, and, and Lark said this, but I'm going to like re-emphasize it, we passed the bond in 2020 to build the three schools, and we passed it for 173 or 170 million. But then we had 20 in reserves. We were supposed to be able to build the schools for 190 million dollars. Then COVID hit, prices went up, and that high school ended up and and maybe 20. I think we 20 wells stayed the same price. The high school ended up costing us more. So without the $50 million issue of the legislative money, we still were short. So we would have found ourselves in this situation. I'll, I, I'll never forget after that board meeting, I thought, oh, we tried. We didn't want to be on the news for being short money. We even built in some extra money in there, and COVID killed us. So it really we would be in a situation of having to do this MBA bond scenario anyway, correct, Lark? Is that fair to say? Or in a scenario where we were short, we didn't have the money to finish the junior high. Yeah. Is that? It was always our backup plan it was just our, in case. Um, in, in theory, we actually thought we were going to get the full $50 million from the state, and we thought that we wouldn't need to issue MBA bonds if that were the case. But well, that we had was to change our plan. Yes, that was after yeah, the fact. Yeah. But before all of that when we knew we were short. So I just wanted to remind everyone of that from that kind of got gets overshadowed by the 50 million from the, you know, the legislative situation that happened November 27th ish. So, um, Elizabeth. Well, and can then, I, can oh, I yes. say just one last thing? Yes. And then just, on to just, Elizabeth. this is my last slide. And, and, and I just want to thank a few people. First off our employees, who I just want to say our employees have been super duper patient through this whole thing. And I know it's caused angst and unrest, um, but to all employees here in the boardroom and listening online, just a sincere thank you from me. It has been a very long, hard three and a half months. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very thankful for the support the employees have showed uh, me, have showed uh, our executive staff, and, and showed the Board of Education as we try to maneuver this. Also, the citizens of Tooele County, although I did hear I've been called names on the 411, so, you know, <laughs> that I'm scum and I've lost all of our money is what I was told. So, yeah, that's, that's nice. Um, and thank you to the Board of Education. Um, I, I was uh, 
very impressed with how our board came together and, and worked uh, through the legislative session. It, it was nice to see. It was enjoy to, enjoyable to be a part of. So I don't want your sacrifice and your hard work to go unnoticed. We actually did have many legislators uh, I, I, that, that I met with, that you met with, that, that were on our side and were really fighting for Tooele County School District, that understood that what happened to us was not right. And they, they did all in their power to try to rectify this situation. Um, I, I will, uh, Bridger Bolander, one of our representatives was great. Um, I met with uh, Senator Ibsen. I met just so many people that, that understood where we were coming from and really did try to help us uh, mitigate this. Um, also, individuals from the State Office of Education, uh, many of them helped us and gave us ideas, try this, try that. And then a uh, very special thank you to uh, Keith Bird and the Toil Education Foundation. I always say that one day I'm just going to lose it over this. I'm going to go in a corner and cry, but I'm not trying not to tonight. But we could not have done what we did without the Education Foundation. I'm convinced. I wish we would have got more than $10 million. I'm convinced. And I was told right after the legislative session that on the last week, on Monday, the number we were getting was zero. And then that number went up to 5 million, and then it went up to 10 million, and then it went back down to 8 million, and, some, and then it went up to 15 million. On Thursday afternoon at about 1.30, 2.30, I got a phone call in my office, and they said, ooh, we think you're good. It's going to be good news. We were thinking probably 15, maybe even $20 million. And by Friday night, it was back down to 10 million. I don't know all the reasons for that, but I do know this. I, I, I'm convinced we would not have... Uh, gotten what we did if it wasn't for the help the education foundation gave us so thanks to all those people um thank you so, so by all means now feel free to ask us questions and we'll do our best to answer them elizabeth so first i think it should just be clarified publicly about if a mistake was made with and why the 50 million you want me to answer that yeah that would be wonderful um if a mistake was there was no mistake made by any person in Tooele county school district when it came to pre pre when it came to preparing our budget for fiscal year 24 the year we're in right now um, we did everything that we were supposed to do we followed all the procedures that we'd followed every year always con creating our budget the problem happened when the legislature changed a code and made it retroactive to July 1st, which then caught us in a funky situation and depleted our budget. Uh, remember, we had gotten our the full budget allocation in July, August, September, and October. Then in November, they told us, oh, this code, here's really what happened. They said the code was going to change. And the code did change in January, but they started taking our money from us in November. That'd be like the police officer saying, hey, two months from now, we're gonna change the speed limit from 35 to 15. But because you were going 35, you still get a ticket today, even though the rule doesn't change for two months. And so, yeah, I, I just wanna be clear on that. We did nothing wrong. The state changed the rule on us and made it retroactive to July 1st. So if we wanna punish somebody, the punishment should be with our senators and representatives with all due respect that they deserve. But they're the ones that changed the rules on us and changed our funding. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Could I just add to that really briefly? Um, and it's public. Can you information anybody can go on and see but you can actually pull up the documents that was were given to us in april of last year and see that they had Tula county school district supposed to be getting 200 million right there from the state of utah and then six months later 150 i'd ask anybody any reasonable person how could you foresee that coming even we even have people from the state who have been quoted as saying 
that I don't know that I would have even known that this could happen. Now, I get it. They're blaming everything on a shortfall in money, didn't have the money, and they had to make this change. But uh, let's face it, it's never been done in the, in the state before. And uh, we just had to be a model example. 31, 31 school districts in the state of Utah declined in enrollment. 30 of those students were held harmless and got full funding. One was not held harmless and lost money, and that was Tula County School District. Because they make the laws, that's why. Elizabeth. And then also I have people asked if the schools, referring to Deseret Peak and Stansbury High, or Junior High, will be finished. Yes, will absolutely. Well, as long as we get a $50 million MBA bond, yes, they will. <laughs> but we do have to have that. But yes, they will. So just so that the public knows that this is a board meeting. We're not, we're not able to take questions from the audience. So um, after the meeting, I'm sure that you can catch any of us after and we can have conversations. But um, I did have a question, um, Mark or Lark, about um, the, the state. There was at one point, and I'm sorry I don't know the name of it, but the state office potentially had a special program for, for school districts in distress. I don't know what the official term was, but but is it po is is have we investigated that and what if so what were the terms of that because I, I'm just thinking that maybe the interest rates could be lower than that fifty million dollar bond through an MBA process have we investigated that at all? We have reached out to them have not heard back from them. Yeah, I get, got an update on that today and they've asked for a couple more days to give us uh, information. So I hope by the end of the week, maybe the first of next week, we will have more information on that. Yeah, I, I just think before we can make a decision, we have to know all those options. I mean, that, you know, whatever that is. Clearly, we're going to have to borrow some money. It's just where does it come from, right? Yeah, you're like, uh, whether or not we do an MBA bond or something else. Something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was one question. I don't... I've got some others. And then to clarify to the public with the MBA bond, will that increase their taxes or how does that eventually get paid back? The current MBA bond will not increase taxes. We did a truth in taxation last August, uh, which, which Lark mentioned, and it brings in a little bit over $3 million. And the MBA bond that we are proposing now we have we will use that money from last year and, and so we have that money ongoing and that will pay for the, the 50 million mba bond that we are proposing tonight it's like the mortgage yeah pay, exactly that, through that yeah. small tax increment that we did last year will cover that but to answer but if we stick with this plan and do small tax increments yes, people will see an increase. But to cover the MBA bond, not really because it's already in there. Is that? Yeah, that's Because I don't want to get up here correct. and say, no, we're not raising taxes. And then we do a small incremental one that we just talked about. Yeah. That, yeah. that that's an yeah, option. Yeah, that's so. correct. That, that's how we fund teachers. So, you know, when we think about uh, Desert Peak and Sansbury High are unique because we really won't have to hire a lot of new teachers. Most of those teachers will come from our, our surrounding schools because the teachers follow the kids. There are some specialty, you know, you only have one choir teacher normally, one band teacher. So some of those we have. In, uh, and so that's where uh, those small tax increases help. Also, usually we get an increase yearly in the WPU and, and those that helps uh, fund those as well. Could I add... Uh... Alex isn't Alex Buxton isn't here our financial advisor he will be next month so you can get this straight from his mouth but uh, given that they had a, a legislative change recently to and how we would have to advertise and uh, put restrictions on certain MBA bonds or, or lease revenue bonds I just wanted to clarify uh, there is a perception out there in the public because I heard him say this there's a perception out there that in order to issue these bonds you have to increase taxes and the actual answer to that is no um, these the way that these bonds are um, legally constructed you just have to dedicate revenues to them now that doesn't have to be property tax revenue but let's 
that's um, one that we do have control over. But you just have to know that you have enough funds to make the debt payment. It would be just like you would in your own. I like the example somebody talked about their own personal budget for uh, financing whatever project that may be. Just making sure that you have the ongoing funds to pay for that have to be dedicated. All right. Oh, Elizabeth. And so then when talking about a tax increase with the maximum and minimum, that would happen in June and this summer when we do the truth in taxation, not right now. Yeah. Uh, and you guys get to determine the amount. So yeah, truth in taxation, uh, we have to do a budget in June that Lark will present in June. And then uh, the board makes a decision if they'd like to go through truth in taxation. And that uh, happens in August of, next, of, of this year. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I, you can clarify. I thought that you were showing options. It was either this big of a tax increase or this plan. Well, With the, this plan has small incremental. Tax that's increases. exactly right. So okay. if you follow this plan, it's small incremental it, tax it's increases. Not the big one, if so. you try to fill plug the hole right now with taxes, it's the big one. Yeah. Because remember, one of our goals was to to with as low as impact on taxpayers as possible. Uh, okay, so do we need to give some sort of direction as far as, I mean, we've already approved the MBA bond, I think in November, October-ish. Do we need to, or I, like prepare a budget? I, or? I, I don't think at this point we need to provide direction. The superintendent and Lark can correct me, but I think what, I think what they're doing is presenting an option as we start exploring and working on budgets, correct? Yeah, I, I think, Superintendent, I would like to know if you support that, because if you didn't like this plan and wanted to shoot holes in it, we'd like to know that. But I think we, the intent was we would proceed unless we hear otherwise. Yeah, yeah uh, for me, I, I would just be honest, uh, uh, we, have, we do have staffing needs that I need to know if I can open positions um, to get that we know we're going to need for next year. And so uh, it would be nice to know uh, at least a, a general direction, understanding kind of like what member Brian said, we don't have to decide today on if it's going to be an MBA bond or uh, a low interest loan from the state or, or, or what, uh, because that technically we have enough money construction wise to get us through for a while because we're issuing $30 million here in a couple months. Um, but knowing, knowing if you guys are good with this allows us to move forward with some of the initiatives that we need to do to prepare for next school year. Um, so, but, but your, your call on, on how you want to proceed. Um, Julia and then Scott. So I'm just wondering if small incremental taxes are like holding the tax rate the same, or would, would it be below the 200 that you showed in the other, the 222 or whatever it was in that other slide? I mean, I know we don't know exactly because we need to do that, but is that kind of like what we're thinking a small incremental tax increase would be? Yeah, whatever. I mean, yes, in that I was using last year's numbers just for a reference, but um, will it be a flat tax rate? That part I don't know until we get the assessed valuations. But the intent is whatever you feel comfortable with as a school board. Because um, I, I was throwing this out there as assuming that if you saw $364 increase that you think, oh, that's too much. And if that's the case, then when we say smaller, whether you divide that up into fourths or thirds or whatever you feel comfortable with as a school board. But yeah. there be a minimum in order to meet the payroll with this plan or we've got Not that to meet payroll. Out without yeah this would just be to again fill your reserves for capital projects yeah. Oh, okay yeah remember moving moving from the local capital levy into general fund takes care of payroll that that that's one of the most important parts right there is being able to to make sure that we have that 12.8 million ongoing so Scott and then Bob what I think I heard, I, I guess I want to clarify to make sure I heard what I thought I heard. I, that may not be the same. But um, with the WPU at 4.8 million, and if we made an assumption that all of that came where it's short 
what I thought I caught there, Lark, in one of those slides, was that if we were to rip the Band-Aid off all at once, it was like 227 or whatever that number Julia was looking at too, that, um, but that would cover that because we would plan on using the four, all of that 4.8 WPU for that. Is that, did I see that number correctly? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. So if we were to do a one-time tax increase of $200, that would we would be in the clear moving forward yeah and just for for clarification for the public 227 dollars a year on a home valued at 462,000 if your home's less than that it'd be less yes. if your home's more than that it's going to be more so the other so that i did read that correctly i just wanted to make sure um the other thing that was kind of just in passing or i i saw that number some numbers up there too we still have on the, in the budget some pretty significant capital items that I might suggest could help lower that amount. And I realize we can't do it ongoing, but I, I noticed, for instance, that we have allocated, we, we've not stopped purchasing bus, buses every year. And you know that's $1.6 million every year. I realize that we can't go forever without buying new buses, but if we put a moratorium on it for even one year, there's another $1.6 million that kind of helps offset some of that. Um, other ones, I, there's textbook adoption. Next year, I think it was 500 k and I think it was $2 million the following year. And, and again, I'm not, I recognize that we can't go forever without buying new textbooks. But skipping one year of, of textbooks can save 500000 next year or $2 million the following year. And the, the third one I noticed was... Um, on technology, that, that, there, that there's technology budgeted for over $5 million, and that I would suspect the most of that is probably around Chromebooks for students. I mean, there's, there's also technology upgrades for, for teachers and those things. But again, if we skipped even one year, that, that starts to, you know, if you skipped one year of all that, it's over $7 million. I, and I realize we can't do that sustained for a four- or five-year period, and I'm not suggesting that. But I'm just suggesting that even if we could just do that for one year, you know, kind of go on that crash diet for a year, it, it could really help things um, kind of infuse that cash. So I, the question was, and, and one other, so you asked the question, you know, could we endorse the plan? I don't know that I'm comfortable with, in a sense, endorsing a plan that implies that we're already kind of almost past a truth and taxation hearing, right? Um, we, we recognize that there's processes involved. Uh, you know, we didn't advertise this as a, as a tax hearing. I don't know that we can say, yes, we're going to do this plan because of so many other variables. What I think I would be comfortable in saying is that we're supportive of the direction you're going and that we recognize that we're going to have to probably take a loan to cover some of that monies. But as far as amounts and specifics, I, I'm not sure that, I'm comfortable with that, and, and in fact, I'm, candidly, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of saying, yes, we're going to raise taxes by any amount because we're not to that point and we're not in a truth and taxation hearing. So that's just the feedback. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I'm on board. Yeah, and uh, in th that's the number six item on there, the implement additional ongoing cost-saving measures. Uh, that we need to look at and say, okay, where, where can we save a million dollars, $2 million? Because then when it does come down to truth and taxation, we could say one year, we're okay. We, we've cut enough, we're okay for this year. Or it's a lower amount or whatever or, right. the case Instead may be. Instead of 200, it, right. we could get by with 135 yeah, exactly. or, or yeah. whatever yeah. that, not, and I have no idea that number. I'm not, don't yeah. want to be quoted as promising anything, but, but I think that's, the only reason I'm not, if, if the ask is endorsing the specifics of the plan, right. I'm I, not. I agree with that. Uh, and the because there's no, there's no way yes. for us to know the specifics, so. Well, I, <clears throat> I think because, you know, as Lark pointed out, we have to see the assessed values and we have to see a lot of things. But I also understand the staffing needs. So I think in concept, I think for me as well, you know, like what Scott's saying, I think that we need to be able to have that flexibility and move into the staffing needs and 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 go with the plan you know not 
wholeheartedly because there's a whole lot of moving parts that still have to happen a meeting you know a meeting dedicated to a, a bond and things like that but i think i think in concept i think we need to be able to say let's move in that general direction in order to take care of staffing needs yeah and remember um I, I just can't emphasize enough <laughs> those goals that we had small taxes teachers keep their jobs th those are just those are just things that that i put on the executive staff um, as a matter of fact i will tell you i remember when i said it in a meeting and then there was a person in the meeting that i think about lost it because they didn't think it'd be possible and uh, a couple weeks later we, we started to develop a plan um, and so it is much grief as I get sometimes as superintendent and the executive staff sometimes gets superintendent. I, I hope the, our employees can recognize we really put you first and foremost. Number one goal, every employee employed by Tola County School District this year has a job next year. And to figure out a way to fix a $12.8 million ongoing budget deficit and everyone keeps their job, I think that is remarkable work by um, our executive team. And, and hats off to Mr. Reynolds for being able to figure this out and come up with a way to, to protect the jobs of our employees. Will there be pay raises? I don't know. Probably not, but maybe, I don't know. But I think everybody is will be grateful next year when they know i still have my full-time job no one got riffed no one lost a job so okay um it goes back to do we need a motion no of, that's what i was gonna say do oh, we i, I, I don't think we'll need a motion <laughs> i don't think we need a motion i i think the yeah. i think the uh the direction is clear from the board we can we can move forward however i understand that we need to continue to look at ways to uh to tighten our belt yeah. and uh, do what we need to do and, and that that'll be my next thing with executive staff is uh what what can we do and we'll we'll start that process okay i do I'm gonna say. Oh, yeah. Um, I really there we go. Impressed with this plan, and um, I'm definitely want to make sure that we're using our money well, and that we're tightening up as much as we can. But I just want to say this for the record for everyone that just because we have to um, tighten our belts, like you could cut a million dollars here and be like, "Yay, we've got it." We have to keep in our mind that there are some very significant. <laughs> needs still in the school even under our current budget i've been in a lot of schools this week and and things like oh yeah sometimes we're just locked in our school because the front doors just literally won't open um this is a true thing and um <clears throat> other things like you know a school is in turnaround but they don't have enough money in their um trust lands budget to hire enough aids that they need or nobody will come and do those positions because we're not paying enough or think some really significant needs that are out there and so I don't want to make the citizens of Tooele County be punished but also um, I do want us to have these conversations with in mind that there are some really significant needs out there that you can't um, ignore. That came before some of the issues that are before the $12.8 million shortfall, for sure. So, okay. Well, we will um, go back into 6.1 boundary realignment. I'm sorry if some of you are wondering how that didn't make sense. And I found myself thinking the same thing. I think I was, um, anyways, sorry about that. I will just publicly <laughs> apologize. I, um, got confused on a few of the attachments, but I think everyone hearing that at the beginning of the board meeting when we're on our game is also important, and we'll move on to um, elementary boundary realignment. Um, <laughs> I got a text from a board member, why are you the point of contact on this thing, on this discussion? And I texted the superintendent, why am I the point of contact on 
the discussion for the elementary boundary realignment, and he reminded me that um, this was something that the board put, um, decided that we, when we approved the high school boundary, um, we wanted some more budget information, which really is in regards to West. And so it's more, we have that information now, and if we have questions, we do have um, uh, Brian Beccarini here from the uh, boundary committee and uh, S Scott Bryan and I were also on the boundary committee anyways to go through this uh, the elementary boundaries so let's go ahead and start discussing who has questions comments concerns uh, West Elementary you've got the uh, report from uh, the architecture firm, I believe, and the building report. And uh, it looks like Scott has the first question. Well, I was just going to comment. We, we've all had a chance to, we've all received and had a chance to review the, the estimated costs um, for West Elementary. Uh, you know, I, I put that off a, a little bit. Uh, well, not a little. Last meeting, I wasn't. I, I had said I wasn't comfortable until I kind of had a sense of where the costs were. Um, the the key number is that it, a rough estimate of, of about four and a, or four hundred fifty thousand with about a hundred thousand dollars recommended to keep in contingency, so that it was about five five hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and the estimate would be. <clears throat> and recognizing it's only that, that doesn't mean that something doesn't. <clears throat> whatever you know the oven can go out tomorrow right um but whatever those other costs are but that that felt with some degree of, degree of confidence three to five years probably and and recognizing where we're at um you know my, my thoughts are recognizing where we're at uh, with with the, the boundaries and the student population in twila proper you know, kind of the Twilla City or the Twilla High School boundaries, where we adopted option one for the, the boundaries. Um, it feels like keeping West open at this point makes sense to me. Uh, we're not in a position to do an MBA bond. We're, I think the, the community would need to do, well, obviously would have to do a geo bond, but I think that that would be appropriate. Um, as I recall some of the bonding scenarios that we do have monies falling off, um, you know, in the next few years and that we could probably do a geo bond election without a tax increase um, and and those things would have to be presented to the public but it feels like the immediate or it's not immediate maybe mid-range option of, of keeping west open for that period of time makes sense to me um, it, it also feels like i mean specific to this scenario Knowing that, I mean, this isn't about keeping West open or not. This conversation is around boundaries. But, but knowing and understanding that, it, it feels like to me that we could um, move forward. I think personally, I, I like option B that does provide some relief at Overlake, probably a little more than the others. Um, I recognize that there's some concerns about Sterling. Um, you know, I've heard that throughout. But I also know that w there was some conversation even in the Boundary Committee meeting that we could move some of those special programs uh, to some other schools where there are some seats and, and free up some classrooms and, and do some adjustments that way. So I don't know if you want a motion and we can have a conversation, but I'm thinking I'd like to just make a motion and we can have a conversation on it. But I would motion that we adopt option 1B. Moved by Scott, seconded by Emily to adopt option 1b um let's start with the discussion do you mind putting up on the screen i'm sorry uh just the west building report just because we were talking about that or or we could put the boundary hearing if people have questions on numbers i think do you mind just listening for some of the questions and flip between those sorry <laughs> Read our minds. <laughs> okay. Um, Elizabeth, questions, comments? So with ado adopting option 1B, would that be implementing boundaries K through 3 for West? Brian? I'm, hmm, what is the, 
that's what it was. That's what it was. That's what. No, I think that's what is in the motion. Brian, is that correct? Okay. Julie, I apologize. Okay, so I have a question. Okay, Sterling is going to add more students in every single one of these scenarios. So is it a given for sure that you're going to take some of those SPED classes out? Because there, there is no way. <laughs> you, you Go up to Sterling and spend a day <laughs> that we can do this. Yes, thank you. Don't worry, I spent half my day there today. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> looking at looking at these options, right? Um, the committee was was committed to doing pure feeders. Uh, that's not necessarily a requirement. Uh, so you guys could send us back to uh, look at split feeders, um, and that was one of the recommendations from the last presentation. As reinstate West and and look at other options um i know that that i've talked with some of you around maintaining um, middle canyons current boundary um and and at like adopting 1b overlay middle canyon current boundary over that uh, so that we're not pulling those kids out of middle and then pulling them over to sterling which in effect is increasing their their numbers as far as special uh special classrooms go, um, it would be a significant challenge to find where those can go. Um, and unfortunately, um, that's going to come with added cost and disruption of multiple students. So, um, and, and I'll invite um, Director Lowry to correct me if I'm wrong on this, that if a student who's receiving transportation to a school that's in, let's say, a life skills classroom, um, and we move that life skills north to another school or say like we're going to have it at um, Old Mill. And I'm just using these as random classrooms. It's not the Sterling kids that go to Old Mill. It would be all of the like Rose Springs kids moving up. And it, so it's going to disrupt multiple classrooms for students who thrive on having um, consistency. So Director Lauer, do you have something that you want to add to that? And just with the Twila area, I think we need to consider just how many, like our special education population within the life skills classroom. So we had to open up, well, we moved <clears throat> the West classroom over to North Lake. So we have two life skills over there. And then we have the two at Sterling. And so by shifting them over to say Copper, then Copper would have to shift over. And so within the Twila area, it's needed to have those four classrooms in that um, smaller area, just when it comes to transportation and busing and just the impact with that student population. Does that address your question? Yeah, I mean, well, it answers the question about special ed, but I just, I think we need to have a different solution for how many students there are in Sterling. Um, Emily, excuse me, and yeah. then we'll come back. So Julie. it was my understanding, and you can clarify this, that if we were to keep west open then that would help alleviate some of the overcrowding at uh settlement and at um sterling at Sterling's and at sterling settlement. only settlement and north lake okay so west boundaries as they are drawn on that map don't cross over main street if we cross over main street we, which is a possibility we can go okay. back to committee uh we will have to bus um students in that capacity whereas if you overlay middle canyon instead of adding a bus route to sterling your those students will walk to school right how many students is that approximately, it's approximately 80. Mm -hmm. okay so that's a bus how, how many did you say 80. 80. so as far as these special classrooms west is very close to sterling we can't move them there i mean it's not very i mean if they're being there bussed won't be anyways, space there there won't be space there not when we add in the k-12 or the k-3 West. That's what he just said. So by adding K three to West, you won't have the space to run those two life skills classrooms that are currently at Sterling. So could we? Well, this would have to go back to committee, I believe. Correct. Could we move 
west boundaries across Maine? Correct. Then we, we can go back to and committee. And that would relieve. We, we don't have to go back to committee. I was going to gonna say, do changes. we have to go back to committee? Couldn't it just. We can make those changes right here, right now. I yeah, would, we should. I would oh, I'm sorry. Just I recommend see. that. Uh, Bob, and then let's go back to Julia. We don't have transportation here to have those conversations of what the numbers would be. So to make that decision without them. I'm not comfortable with it, but you guys are the board. So okay. I just want that stated. Bob and then I, I, I think that I think the goal and and I understand everybody's looking at wh where we can move things and what we can do. But I think the goal is, is if we're going to stay with pure feeder schools, which that seems to be a desire of the board for the most part. And I think the key factor, as I've talked to Brian and a few others, is we have to have West as a boundary. I think as we draw that boundary, I think, because I've talked to board member Brian about this, as we draw that boundary, where does that boundary land? Because I think there are some key points of what needs to happen. One is we need to find some relief for some overcrowding. And, and, and if that means the boundary needs to be redrawn to an over, you know, past Main Street, then I think that's what we have to look at because Sterling definitely needs some relief. I understand the moving, uh, the moving of classrooms or the moving of programs is maybe more difficult, but I think, I think the flexibility that we have in this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the flexibility is right now West doesn't have an existing boundary. So if we draw that boundary in to wherever it helps with the relief, because I know it's going to help Sterling on the south side, it's going to help you mean settlement. settlement, yeah. S settlement on the south side, North Lake on the north side but it could also help alleviate some of the overcrowding in sterling depending on where that east boundary is drawn correct yes and in 1b we have west drawn in without it going across maine so that's why that's why there would need to be then just correct just make sure make sure i'm thinking right that's why you're saying if we reconvene or at least look at that boundary that would allow some help from in all three directions correct? absolutely okay let me go to julia and then elizabeth or emily excuse me it's okay. and so if we draw the boundary across maine did, do you know how many students that is or we don't have enough we haven't students? calculated that and, and we don't know where how far how many blocks up so we would i would rely on our specialist uh um Riley Ernst to go through and, and give us various scenarios as a committee to determine to determine like what neighborhoods, how far up, what the busing cost is going to be associated to that. Um, there, there, there's more than just picking a, a block. Right. Yeah. Well, I would like to have that done before we make the decision because even if we do the Middle Canyon overlay, 80 students is just almost going to put Sterling where they are right now not that, really relieve it too and much. that breaks up the feeder but sorry let me stick to my uh, um Emily and then Elizabeth okay yeah I really like what Bob was saying I think that's yeah just different options like that but just throwing it out there um if Middle Canyon loses some students would they have any classrooms for special um special classes it's possible it depends on the number of kids I mean because yeah if you're taking like right. a couple per grade level it doesn't do much correct uh, Elizabeth and then Bob again so to clarify though option 1b has done some relief for Sterling no it hasn't no it, so option 1b if you look at there's um, kind of that um, line that that's curves up it follows a ditch so mm -hmm. currently it goes straight across um it's valley view way um over to broadway and up what we've done to add relief on this component is dropped coppers down to 400 north um to incorporate that portion that is currently sterling but ultimately what we did is a swap um and then we've also, since the Boundary Committee has ha convened, um, we've had the Harris Apartments open. Um, and so that's 65 units uh, at 1.5 kids per, on average per unit. You're looking at another 120 kids added to Sterling. That are transient. So, yeah, yeah, correct. Thank you, Scott. 
And they are zoned for Sterling, the Harris, That's and correct. that has come into place since then. That's correct. Can, I, I am sorry. Can you tell me really quick what the where is Harris? I, I mean, is it on the east or west side of Maine? Sorry. It, it's on the east side. East side of yeah. Maine. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I think we're back to Bob. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to look at this in a simplistic model. Okay. And I understand because any way I look at it and help me out, uh, Dr. Baccarini, but it looks like to me the way to do this is if we adopt 1B, which is fine. Okay. If we adopt 1B, then what has to happen is the committee with your specialist looking at population across Main Street would have to be part of that conversation, correct? Correct. Because I, th I, think, I think in order to make this work, in order to help out as many schools as we can help out with that overcrowding, along because uh, 1B would allow us maybe some flexibility in the Overlake area, to Copper, whatever. I think in order to do that, I think the answer is Let's adopt a let's adopt it with the challenge with the charge that it needs to be pulling some Sterling students to the west boundary or you know trying to help alleviate some of the overcrowding because I'm in agreement as I as I have been up around you know and trying to look at the boundaries and things I think Sterling is in is is going is in an unmanageable situation right now because a lot of building is going on in that area, so I think I think the west boundary has got to push east, in my opinion. And I and I appreciate your answer that you can't really give us any numbers until you have that person sit down. And I don't geo mapping is that what it's called? <coughs> until you have that geo mapper sit down and say this is how many households would be affected by that. And I I think I think we have to. I think that helps the conversation, and I think it allows us to move on and give you a direction to pursue. Yeah. So do we need to change a motion if you're suggesting to chart or change, adopt 1B, but with the charge well, to well, look at West? What we could simply, I'm not doing it yet, but I'm just thinking out loud, is that we could, we could simply adopt 1B uh, and move, and, and and I don't know. You have to get the whole committee together, but but with the charge to move approximately seventy-five to one hundred and fifty students from the Sterling boundary to West, and I think you leave it approximate because you want to do some natural boundaries, right? We don't want them to say, oh, it will be eighty-three, and they're going to have to go through and you know through a neighbor, whatever that looks like, but. But approximately 75 to 150 students from Sterling to West, w moving the boundary to the, yes, moving the boundary east and also to the south, because there's the Settlement Canyon area that's very nat would be a very natural geographic area. And, and I don't know how many students that, that even involves. But that's why I'm saying just we could amend it, adopt it, we could be done with this, with just that one charge of finding that natural geographic boundary that goes and fills in the rest of those seats that we're trying to get out of Sterling into West Elementary. And, and I would be comfortable. So, so in the, that, the 1B, is that the one that we're yeah. saying? Does that have the overlay taking those students out of um, well, yeah, so those you're gonna, 80? Yeah, the, can so we do that it's, in addition to It's decreasing this? Middle Canyon's number. So you can see on that, that chart there, they go from 593 to 554. Um, and, and Sterling's going from 781 to 940. Um, with the understanding that that's approximate based on boundary exceptions, I know one of the studies that we've done with Middle is that they're not getting as many boundary exceptions out of the Stands. northern uh, elementary boundaries, uh, but they do have a significant amount out of um, the Sterling boundaries currently, um, with about 34 households um, that are opting over to uh, middle at the current time. If that's for DLI, we'll likely see some of that shift over to North Lake. Um, but yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, hold on, Scott. Let me go to Elizabeth. First and then Scott, back to Scott. So with the idea of moving us 
variety of students from Sterling, I think it would be better to not tie them into saying you, they have to go to West or have to go to Settlement, just leaving it more open, but, but, but just moving them. So, what do you mean? Say it I, again. I, can so, I answer that? No, 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 I'm not saying, so like say some could go to settlement. So rather than in our motion saying moving 75 to 150 students to West, just saying moving 75, 75. to 150 students from Out Sterling. Out of Sterling. I, 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 think that, I think that the thing that we need to remember is no matter where this boundary is drawn, we still have open boundaries. And, and kids are going to go wherever they're going to go. I, I, think, I think the object here is, is, yeah, we set that goal of, a, of 75 to 100, but we try to at least establish a boundary because you're still allowing students that if they're in sixth grade at North Lake, they're not going to go back to West. They're, not, they're going to stay where they're at. So I think we have to remember there's that flexibility, and that was built in by the committee as the committee met. And so I think, I think that we have to just establish a boundary on the east side that would help us by, by the virtue of moving some students, you know. Uh, and it may be in the future. It may not be all at once, you know, but I think we have to look at that. And, and I'm comfortable with, with what Scott was, was proposing, but I think I don't know if that means the whole committee or personally I'm comfortable if they come back and report to us this is where the boundary's at, you know, because I think that's a conversation that's going to have to take place with, ge and with the geomapping and, and, and the okay. specialists in those areas. My, my only concern is Will we be able to capture 75 to 100 kids or whatever? I'm just going to say 75 enough without, like, going to across the street from Sterling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, oh, no, we'll be able to capture that. Yeah, okay, I just don't want us to, like, give you something and be like, well, and we don't have kids to, a block away now. I mean, we're when you look at you look at Middle Canyon and the okay. way that it, it kind of juts into copper, right? Like, we okay. can... That's that's where Riley's really going to come in. He he's got the heat maps of where families live, yeah. what that, that socioeconomic looks like, and we can not yeah. necessarily go all the way across and up Main, but we could go up four blocks over this way, five blocks this well, way, and it's going to capture yeah. this number of and students. And one thing I I was going to say, I really was looking at the middle situation earlier, but that does change the. Um, the pure feeder system. And I know, every, you know, some people have all these, well, we all have our own opinions on pure feeders. And if we can do it, I think we should do it. Keep those pure feeders. That's what um, we, that was one of the goals of the boundary committee. So I, I think that if, if we so, think we could pull those out and keep it within that and, and, high and feeder system. And recognizing that those numbers will be pulled out based on, K six and we're we're going to be pulling K three so K three schools and schools and relief. families will need to recognize that it's going to take time for that relief to come, um, but that's that's a natural process of enrollment at elementaries. And I dared hear the comment after Bob said, you know, the problem is people walk with their feet because of open boundaries. And I think I heard someone say, "We'll close them. We can't by law close them. It is a state law." Um, we can close them once they hit a certain capacity and anyways so, it's open boundaries so in the state of utah I, so so i would modify my motion to say we adopt 1b with one modification of adding between 75 and 150 students from the sterling boundaries to the west boundaries Okay, it's been moved by Scott, seconded by Emily to adopt option 1B uh, with the charge to m expand the west boundaries to pull around s between 75 and 150 kids out of Sterling. Any discussion to that motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, let's move on to revised policy 5001, student travel. It's a first read. Oh, but it's been pulled. So we are, 
Now moving on to revised policy 2002, Central Office Administration first read. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Sure. Okay, so what you have in front of you is some modifications based on model policy. Make some adjustments to the language under uh, the business administrator, as you see in green and the strike through in red. So uh, this is a first read. If you wanna take a look at it a little bit longer, you're welcome to. If you haven't had a chance to go over a couple of pages of additions, <laughs> then we can move that forward. Or if you're ready, we can accept an implementation, however you would like. I just have one question comment. I know that um, over the years, I th this part of the policy, and, and I apologize to bring this up kind of cold turkey, says that she'll have one assistant superintendent who is assigned by the duties. And um, I think that's been a policy to have one assistant superintendent for years. Are we um, kind of hijacking, not hijacking, I don't know the right word, um, demanding that stay in policy when our district is growing. And I know we don't want to see the district office grows. Everyone says, oh, the district office, too many people at the district office. But I will remind you, well, maybe we haven't. I know we've said this publicly. We are one of the smallest district offices in the state that runs our school district. Um, I'm not saying we need to have seven assistant superintendents, but I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm just, can we can change the policy when we see fit to it? Okay. All right. Yeah. For okay. Sounds good. Uh, for perspective, when I started. Well, I know. I just wanted to make sure that. Here, sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, just for perspective, when I started um, in 2000, we had three assistant superintendents and we had 7,800 students. Oh, wow. Then. Okay. So, but you didn't have area directors, maybe? No, no, we did not. I mean, so just the I setup mean, there was, was a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, okay. economy of scale, but that just okay, for perspective. Good. So however you want okay. to see. All right. Is there any other questions, comments? We ready to move it to a f second read, or do we adopt here? Uh, okay, let's, Scott. I'll motion we adopt policy, revised policy 2002 as presented. Second. Been moved by Scott, seconded by Bob to adopt policy, policy 2002 as presented. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 6.4 revised policy 1005 board meetings first read. Okay, uh, so uh, to take you back a few months, we revised this uh, in November and uh, made some changes and um, one of the thoughts uh, going forward, uh, I'm sure some of the board members on the policy committee might want to weigh in if they want to, um, the discussion about possibly uh, breaking out so it's not everything together. Um, in November when we talked about it before, um, that was basically putting everything uh, that had to do with a board meeting under this policy. So it's really however you want to proceed. And then there's some additional uh, changes. I, I did throw another color at you, uh, just so you know, everything in the orange is what is not required by um, model policy, but that is in there. So um, where's the orange? Yeah, I don't see the orange. That was in our draft. That's in the, uh, it is, uh, it's not there. So. It, should have been under after number four, but we uh, we understood that after we had the meeting, we did, we had a quick turnaround to get this to you. So, if you want to, um, you can feel free to move that forward, and that way you can absorb uh, a pretty lengthy policy. So. I, I, we can talk about it though. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we don't spend all our time absorbing. Um, <laughs> it, there are some things that we have to make decisions on. Um, and the two biggest things are, well, there's three. <laughs> um, it talks about electronic meetings. Um, so state code allows us as a board to choose 
if you want to zoom into the meeting and you're just your only one person that wants to zoom into the live meeting, that you have to give the board president notice. We as a board can choose an increment of time between 24 hours and three days. Currently, our policy says three days, but as on policy committee, we were reading state code and we thought, um, I and, and others, Elizabeth and stuff, thought that if we reduced it to the 24 hours, then it would be better for things that come up because generally, you know, you can't say, well, in three days, there's going to be a heart attack in my family or something like that. So that 24 hours gives you more of a chance to, um, to be able to make some of those meetings. Um, but if the full board doesn't agree, then we can keep it at three days or do two days or 28 hours or whatever you want. Um, but that's one thing. So I'll go on to the next thing if there's no questions about that. Um, the other thing is, what's that? Do you want to just, specific to that, my thought is 24 hours is great. Yeah. What, yeah. what difference is, I mean, nothing changes whether it's one day or three days. I agree. Why not have that convenience <laughs> for, for whatever those emergencies or the situations? So that is my two right. bits. I mean. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we do it. Unless people disagree, 24 hours on that one. And the other thing is um, state law allows us to have a 100% virtual meeting if certain conditions are met. Like it's an emergency and all the conditions are, are written here. Um, right now, our policy does not allow that. Right now, there has to be an anchor location in our policy. Right. So if there were to be a natural disaster or something pandemic, um, there would still have to be four people together uh, in an anchor location to have the meeting or we're not allowed to have it. So our thought was in policy meeting that um, it would be really sad if we came to a situation where we needed such a meeting and we were not able to do so. So we felt like it would be smart to adopt the model policy language on allowing us to have a 100% virtual meeting. Um, so you guys have thoughts on that? I think that's great. I so think, yeah. go ahead. So that's what all the, the you know, the first two things um, are. And the other thing that's. Was boundary notice. The boundary notice, that's just model policy. Don't we yeah. just have to do that anyways? Yep. Yeah, yep. I think we have to do that anyways. So um, let's see. And the same with the closed meetings part. But the public participation part, <laughs> that is Q. <laughs> Um, we are out of compliance with that. The state said we need to, uh, the code says that we need to have, by last year, uh, adopted a policy that allowed for public comments that are written to be included in our minutes. And we don't have that policy, so we need to, to do that. Um, the model policy, um, it has one way that you can do it. If you don't like that way, that's what Terry has put into Q, is just model policy. Um, and it says that um, written comments could be um, sent through email to the superintendent before the meeting or hand delivered to the district office um, before the meeting. And those comments are not read in the meeting, but provided to the members of the board and including it included in the meeting minutes. So that's model policy. If you would like to adjust it for model policy, we can, but it has to meet the state code requirement that um, written comments can be included in the minutes. Yeah, I'm fine with model the, policy. There's only one change that, and it just got, was when you were striking stuff. Um, right at the end of Q. <laughs> Too much striking? No, you should right go a little bit Q. more. Q1, right at the very end of green. It's between. Third it third doesn't third. need to say between, it needs yes. to say take out between. That's, that's one of the things I was going to point I out. also had a question on that. It says generally. So that means that that, that time's flexible. If we decide we would like an hour instead of a half an hour, uh, that's at the board's discretion. Correct. So we could strike generally also? It's for, for discussion. Between, so. ha between has to be struck. But generally we I mean, can. I, th I think the flexibility is okay if there's a really issue that where we have you know a hundred different people because we always cut it off right at a half an hour and maybe we need a little bit longer but what what is that time I mean what, what we'd have to decide ahead of time or how would how does that work let right. me go to Elizabeth and then Scott and then 
And looking at other districts, they do allow for flexibility if it is a hot topic where they do allow longer public comments. Scott? The flip side of that is when you have 120 people and they all want to address the board, I think we, if we're going to do that, that we ought to be able to trim down the three minutes to even 90 seconds. Because if, if you're really having 300 people here and they all want to comment, they're, they're hitting rewind. You're hearing the same thing. It's really saying, I agree, we should do this. And they can say that in 15 seconds, I mean, or five. But I'm not saying we limit it to five. All I'm simply saying is that... The, if we're trying to instill, if we're trying to insert flexibility in the process, on some meeting, if you know it's going to be a hot topic, we can say, you know what, we're going to go to two minute comp and we're going to go for an hour. If does that make sense? I mean, I think there needs to be flexibility both directions. If that's if we're trying to insert flexibility and length, we another way is to be a little bit more brief on those hot topics so that we don't have to hear the same thing over and over. They can simply say. You know, those feelings have been expressed about boundary W, I feel the same way, and I'm done. And, and just, I think we should have that flexibility both ways. That's all. If we really want to be able to get people through. Um, I can't remember who had their, like, Julia and then... Uh, I was just going to say on that, like, a, sometime, I mean, in the past, what we've done is, there's so many people here, how many people have this exact same issue like after we've heard five of them and have them either raise their hand or stand up so we see okay this how this is how many people have this issue that have come here and then if you have something different to add that we haven't heard or a different com com continue to come up but if if we, we just get a good well, well idea and, and the other thing that's different is the ability to add the written comments and and I think that really emphasizing those written comments are part of our minutes and, and encourage those comments to come. And, and my observation there is that there's not a time limit on written comments. I guess the written comments could be a hundred page or, or five, a thousand page dissertation if they wanted to, it would have to be part of the minutes. But there's no limit on the length. And, and honestly, written comments usually tend to be better thought through, and, you know, and those arguments are better developed. So it's just another thought is that we keep to those and, and I can live either way. But I guess my point being, sometimes I think the, the public feels like they're not heard unless they're here. And if we really emphasize that those written is, is really a great opportunity and you don't all have to say the same thing over and over and over for hours. Yeah, yeah. Emily. Uh, and mine's just more um, considering so right now people can email policy and it was pointed out in in our discussions that um, maybe every person that emails policy doesn't want their thoughts in the minutes so do we need to establish in policy or just a procedure where we would say uh, dear superintendent, this is for such and such board meeting this agenda item and then we know we have to put it in the minutes why don't we just start an email address that says uh, address the board. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, public uh, comment. Public comment. Public at, comment. And, and even with and with a bounce back message, and just set up the bounce back message that says, "Thank you for your comments. These will be added to the board minutes." minutes. minutes. They, remember, they're not read, but there are for public. Con right. They can consume them, but they're not read. But but I think that bounce back message and say, if you did not intend for this information to be published, please contact yes. Jackie yeah. and have this removed before it's published. If if you meant to send this somewhere else. If it's so do we need to address that in policy or just procedure? I think, I th I think it's more of a procedure. Either way. Uh, because I think if you add, start adding a lot to the policy, then it get, becomes kind of Oh, convoluted. this is already a very, very yeah, long it, it gets, it's very It's very long. I think on the flexibility, I think, out, I think the one thing and the only thing that I've really heard uh, from patrons or anybody that's come in the last four years that I've been, <coughs> been on the board is I think the one thing that we have to be cognizant of is as we're asking people to sign up, I think we ought to just get through the list. You know what I mean? Uh, because there has been times that we have cut the list off with one or two speakers because we've hit that magical 30. Well, but even if it lasts two hours and we don't make our curfew. Well, I think, I, think, I think you still have to have, I, I think as you look at that, I think a judgment, it's hard to, it's hard to set a time because you don't ever know how many people are going to sign up, right? So I think we somehow we have to figure out how to set that time 
so that it allows the flexibility. But it, it's just my belief. If, if, if they've signed up, then they have something to say. Well, and, I, and I think we, it, how we ever we adjust the presentation time, then we adjust it. Well, so. if my, I, I do like the 30 minutes because we do have board business to take care of besides. But what, maybe when we end it, if there are others, we could just simply say, please send your comments and they will be added as part of the agenda to whatever that address is. And we can say our 30 minutes are up. However, we notice that several of you still, we would love you to send your comments to the agenda and they will be added to the public record. And that okay. addresses both needs. Mark. Yeah, I just have a question. I have not read through this entire model policy. Do you know with that requirement uh, to be able to have them write in their comments. I'm going to say something. Then let me let me clarify. Are we allowed to edit those? And what I mean by that is, we know in the public comment you can't call out individuals. You can't say uh, so and so a teacher. Blah blah blah. Are are we allowed to go in? Because if they're going to be public, I don't want to have to put in something that that is degrades one of our teachers or one of our employees. Um, it, yeah, redact at least names or something. So. I don't know if it mentions that. If yeah, not, I've got the code we... right here. Okay. But, um, the, the code simply says, no later than July 1st, 2023, a local school board shall adopt a written policy <laughs> that provides a reasonable opportunity for the public to provide both verbal and written comments in a meeting of the local school board. And then it goes on and just describes a board meeting. But um, So my question is, if you look at the minutes now, the people that are presenting every word they say is not in our minutes. Every word we're saying is not in our minutes. So those letters that are submitted, could it just be Jackie's summary like everything else is Jackie's summary? Because it doesn't say in here, it, has, it says, or not Jackie, the person who has her job, whoever that may be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're going to have to find, we're going to find out because I, I don't want to. Opinion on that. Because yeah. Because we don't want to open up the door for commentary that really would go against the statement that we read at the beginning. Exactly. Of the comments, right. So. right. Yeah. I mean, uh, <coughs> ma ma Madam chair, I think in light of what the superintendent brought up and <laughs> trying to find that so that we have that correct in our policy, I move this to a second read. I'll second that. Move by Bob seconded by Scott to move it to a second read, but there might still be some discussion to this. Julia, your mic was on. I just had it back with the flexibility because I really like what Bob yeah. said. I like if they came, they have they put their name down, even if they're they're going to just say this has already been said, but I and I agree with it or whatever because they they they've spent time to come down here and actually yeah you know I was gonna I I wanted to add to that so. Um, since I've been board president and I'm reading this in the last few years, there has, now I'm going to, don't quote me, but I'm almost positive I have never left one or two people hanging before there may have been like a full page left or nine or seven, seven to 10 left. Because when it says 30 minutes, most of the time when it's been a hot topic, we've gone about 45 we've kind of allowed it i don't remember being so i i do remember maybe during covid when it was really tricky during covid there was more emotion during that time than any other board meeting and i know we've had some emotional ones recently so anyways but when we do even allow that 30 minutes where we went 45 like mr brian said we do have business to conduct and so we have to remind the public that the board meeting, yes, it's for public comment, but it's also to conduct the business of the school district. So I would like to strike a balance between the two. So I'm not disagreeing, but I do like the generally, but I was like, well, does that, that leave it up to board president, whoever that may be, remember it changes every so often. You know what, it's a hot topic we're going to say an hour tonight or we're going to say 45 minutes. I, I don't know if it's written in or because then generally <laughs> you're going to get the board president's going to get criticized for deciding 45 minutes when 
maybe there was an hour and a half worth of comments. I, I don't know. It gets tricky. I, I think, though, so. and I think that's I, I agree with you 100 percent on the on the trickiness of it. I think it goes hand in hand with what the superintendent says about what do we have to submit as far as written that the board is going to read, because that's the key is the board is going to read it. Right. I still think I, as you're looking into that, I think that gives you the ability of saying, OK, so how do we give this flexibility in a 30 minute period? You know, what is reasonable? And then and then put that guideline in the in the policy, you know, or or as a procedure attached to the policy or however, I, I think I think there's others that have been able to figure out the flexibility so that it's not maybe a spur of the moment decision is like what you're saying, you know, what is the flexibility here? So. Because really, the amount of times that we have too many patron comments for the time is rare. I mean, when there is a hot topic, we do, but, you know, we go months and months without yeah. ever having to. Yeah. Yes. So one way to think about that is, uh, and, and we'll explore this as well, is that um, kind of like when we get to the end of a board meeting, we need to have a motion to extend. Maybe it's as simple as that. Oh, yeah, a motion to extend. Motion to extend the public comment. And the board decides so, it's not one person that's the. Yeah, yeah then it's a block of time, and then that gives possibility so we'll we'll explore yeah. that and throw yeah. that in so. all right all in favor aye any opposed moves to a second read um revised policy 5021 admission and attendance compulsory education uh looks like the recommendation is to move to a second read are there any questions for angie gillette the title was just through me for what it's worth, I mean, maybe I missed something about admission, but I felt like it's more about just attendance. Isn't this just, I would just say that the title, maybe I didn't, maybe my speed reading missed the, uh, the admission part of this, but it felt like it was very attendance oriented policy. Was there something about admission that I blinked and missed? We can go with that. I mean, I just, we I kind agree. of. We had that originally at one point. We had attendance and possibly compulsory education because well, that and is maybe that's, part of it. But, in yeah, but I didn't say anything about admission. Like, I agree. I, I, can, I, I, I thought, well, what did I miss? I actually went back. Yes. And I'm like, yes. Did I miss something? So. That is part that was in the red that will be part of procedure. That, and that was our old part of the policy where it had a mission so yeah um i don't i, I mean Any i sent you an email but yeah. um, i can go into a little background but i think you know if you yeah, want me no, to for I the public if, or if you have questions i can just answer the questions and emily no just to i think for the public to know <clears throat> that it was decided that it would be a lot more flexible for the district to provide a very solid framework policy and allow the district to work on the procedures which will not be secret they're public also um, but that they could be flexible for what they notice is happening and so um, if we're going to move it to a second read i would ask what are we thinking about and trying to accomplish during this month of moving it forward well, I think if if everyone's comfortable with the with adopting it, let's adopt it. I, if there's no questions, uh, Elizabeth, I do have a question. Then, so for it states that the student has to be at least six years of age, but then how does that correspond with kindergarten? So that part fits state law and and code and kindergarten is not required. Yeah, in kindergarten, yeah. And then we also have our other policy that is entry into school, and that's where that is listed too, with as Dr. Ernst said, kindergarten's not required. That part, in that policy, it talks about the age of entering into first grade. All right, I'm looking for a motion. Does anyone do you want, want to, to change the name, Scott? Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and I I agree with you, and we can if you want to. 
do that. Okay. That. Um, I motion that we adopt policy 5021 um, attendance. Yeah, that's it. I, uh, I dash compulsory education, colon compulsory education. What do we like? <laughs> I'll second. It's been moved by Emily, seconded by Scott to adopt the attendance policy, <laughs> attendance compulsory education policy. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Revised policy 5051, citizenship grading for high school students, first read. Oh, boy. And in the mood of changing names, uh, it doesn't matter how many times I look at these documents, I realize that there was a typo. So this should have um, a line out through attendance and on the title. So this was just citizenship grading for high school students, given that the previous policy that you just adopted addresses the attendance component. So um, you can see the entire thing has been redlined and at the bottom we have it, um, the, the new policy, uh, which really just goes over our philosophy and the board directives uh, from which procedure will be developed. So uh, based on that, I can read it to you or you guys can ask questions. Oh, uh, Emily, I'm sorry. Yeah, just what you shared with us in policy committee about why you chose to separate this from attendance and what you hope to accomplish through this policy, I think it would help everyone to have a good framework. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we met, I actually brought this policy up about a year ago, um, and uh, we, we opted to go on hold as a result of uh, the committee's work that we've done. So. Uh, given that the attendance policy has a, um, a both a, a incentive and a consequence hierarchy for that, we've pulled attendance out of citizenship grading, um, and we'll be developing procedure, which in part was already uh, or partially uh, developed into the previous policy that um, was going to be presented a year ago. Uh, I had put together a team of administrators, I had met with a team of teachers, um, and we had gone through um, the policy and were adding this piece, but redacting this piece, and adding this piece, and redacting this piece. Um, and then when Matt and I talked, it, it really made more sense to pull the attendance component out uh, and focus us into behavior. Um, additionally, our, our current policy is out of compliance with law um, where, and practice, because uh, we did put procedure into that policy, and that's one of the hard things. So. Students right now could uh, clear a U through Saturday school, but we don't offer Saturday school. Uh, we can also, per policy, fine students, but that's illegal. So um, the, the need for this to shift um, is dramatic. And, and given that, I mean, we had almost over 500 bills related to education just this legislative session, the, the constant rotation of change, rather than having to come back and breathe, bring forth policy to change a line um, putting those components into procedure um, and and then outlining that for our high schools. Um, additionally, there's different opportunities at, at each high school, what Wendover has available uh, versus what Stansbury High has available versus Dugway, et cetera, is going to look different. Is that, was that good? Okay, thanks for the thumbs yeah. up. Uh, Julia and then Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I like this way of doing it so that we don't have to constantly change, but on, on the philosophy B1, um, you, on one of the sentences it says, and the outside the classroom and dare subject, and I think you want and are subject. Oh, correct. <laughs> Thank you. Just a little typo. Elizabeth. So to clarify, looking at the school fee schedule, which we'll be looking at soon, it talks about the Saturday school on the fee schedule and also citizenship makeup per you. So to follow policy, should those even be on the school fee? I will defer that to the next person presenting, but from um, my understanding, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, is, is, oh, there, is there a reason why, and there probably is a great reason, but why we didn't do all secondary students, so 7th through 12th? Why did we start in high school and maybe just 
curious why why this doesn't apply. Oh, it's off. Of um, looking at how we how we. And I'm not going to get a ukulele out and sing to you guys. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, so the, the primary reason we have focused uh, to high schools on this uh, in policy is it, there, there's ties to that with graduation uh, expectations uh, versus elementary and secondary, which have more flexibility. Now I can use the microphone even if you can't. But I guess I was just meaning. I don't know, I guess getting them used to in a secondary environment, same kind of concept, but I, I mean, I'm okay with that. I just was really trying to understand why, because they're kind of in that secondary mold. Seems like much of it would apply. Yeah, and so it really came down, I mean, and we can go back and, and, and add that in. Um, really, the procedures will, would, would be separate for um, a junior high versus a high school, especially in regards to being able to walk at but, graduation. But the, pr the procedures will be different, but the philosophy doesn't change. Correct. The, yeah. I guess this state, nothing in this document would change. Right, so we, we could, Does I that mean, make we sense? could I mean, in essence, take this K-12 um, if desired. Because our board philosophy hasn't changed. Nothing here applies. So really, maybe it doesn't limit it. There's only one spot it even said it was and that's just in the definition, in the right, definition of a student, so we would just change that to student enrolled K-12. Yeah, I mean, or, well, maybe not K. I just heard first grade, six-year-olds. Anyway, I, I'm not trying to make it more difficult. I'm, if, in some ways, I guess I'm thinking it actually makes it easier if we just have one guiding philosophy on citizenship, you know, and then you apply it. Yeah, no, I, I, that's fair enough, and, and that's an easy change. Dr. Ernst. Dr. Ernst. Yeah, I was just going to say, you could, uh, thanks for calling me, Brian. You're welcome, Dr. Ernst. Sorry, Madam President. You can throat punch me later. Um, yeah, you could, you could uh, keep the policy 112, and then you could have the procedures for 16, 78, 912. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? I'm looking for a motion then. Since I asked for the change, I, I would motion that we adopt policy five, is it 5051, uh, changing the definition of a student to all enrolled students. And also Julia. And change the name of the policy. And the correction that Julia, and the correction that Julia pointed out. It got more difficult. I need a second. second. Moved by Scott, seconded by Bob to adopt revised policy 5051 <coughs> with the changing of the name for all students and the typo and the title. Any more discussion of that motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, 6.7 has been pulled. We're going to go to 6.8, 24-25, student fee schedule. This is our second read. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, are we ready to adopt? Oh, I have a question. <laughs> okay, let's get going. Okay, so I looked at the prices on it for the lunch and breakfast prices, but at our last work meeting it was stated that the lunch and breakfast prices are going to increase so shouldn't that be included on the school fees those were inadvertently left off but the lunch prices are technically not fees breakfast and lunch are not fees those are set by child nutrition department so i can add those before these are adopted i can tell you what they are mm -hmm. Okay, if you look at the schedule, so breakfast, um, they want they they will move it to two dollars for elementary breakfast. For elementary lunch, it will be two dollars and fifty cents. And then on the secondary, 
breakfast will go to $2.25, and the lunch will go to $3. And then for adult and second meal for students, breakfast will go to $3.50, and lunch will go to $4.50. And that's from our child nutrition director. So thank you. Um, Bob? Oh, Bob and then Scott, sorry. Oh, Scott. I, I just wanted to follow up on our conversation. Help me understand what caps are after our last Yes, month. yes. I, I'm, I've been waiting a month to okay. hear this. So. Yes. Uh, first, first, I wanted to mention that uh, the fee schedule that was first sent to you guys was a previous draft. So we apologize. It was corrected, and you now have the one from last month with only one change, which is to the hotel per night fee. And we can talk about that in a minute after I address um, board member Brian's question. So I looked into the max fee and it is required by state code that we set one. And it does mean, I talked with the state, it does mean that's the max that a student can pay and after that, they don't pay any more. So the, the school or the district would pick up the rest of that. However, the, and this is, this is code, it is R277-407-6, and it's in 4A, where it says a maximum total aggregate fee amount per student per school year must be established by the LEA. And then in, it's part 4D, it says an LEA may establish a reasonable number of activities, courses, or programs that will be covered by the annual maximum fee. And I did find an example of a state, of a district in Utah, some language they used in their, on their fee schedule, and we could adopt something similar to this, or you could. They had a maximum aggregate fee per student of 7,500. And they state up to three activities and one out of state trip can be, oh, that's all that can be included in that max. If they do a second out of state trip or they do more than three, we could state extracurricular activities if that's how we, but beyond three activities, it's not included in that max and the family would be responsible for that. I also looked at some fees, some max amounts that other districts have, and... Can you say what district that was from? Yes. I believe it's Alpine. Alpine School District had that in their fee schedule in 2022 and 2023. However, that same language is not there in their 23-24, so... Uh, other max fees at other districts, Cache County has a max amount of 5,000. Box Elder is 3,500. Nebo is 7,000 and Alpine is 7,500. So, and we are proposing to move ours to 5,000. Do you guys have any questions on that? Scott and then Lark, it looks like. It sounds like that's a policy I you know throw it back over to the policy committee but I would love to have a policy that says something along those lines that doesn't feel like that's a fee schedule adoption number does that make sense we actually have a policy that the number of activities and the travel and that there's a cap that feels like that's really a board okay. policy to me not yeah. an adoption so you know just sneak that in there Terry in one of your policy meetings but Sneak. <laughs> but I mean, I, I just feel like that's, yeah, I know, because you got your agenda's already full. I know that. But that feels like that would be, I like that concept okay. that it does, it's not endless. Uh, you know, we just talked about a lot of money, and some of those can really roll. And especially where we're adopting some of these, I mean, if they're taking, uh, what, drill, I mean, you know, it's 2,000 or 2,100 now. I mean, so I, I do like that. And I guess my other thought was, because of the amounts involved, I'm just wondering if, 
instead of the fourth or proposed 5,000. Now I understand what it is that we adopt that limit to be the 7,000. Um, Lark and then Elizabeth. I was just going to add, I, I said this to Becky and, and Emily after the meeting, but maybe it's not pertinent now that we're understanding, but I think there was a perception out there that that cap would be um, the maximum a program would charge a student. Um, it's just the, I get, what I'm getting at is there's nothing to say that a, a program can't spend eight to $10,000 the thing is they would be capped at five but there is nothing in there that says a program couldn't and and the reason why is because they have their fees you go to their spend plans and oh by the way that doesn't include any trips out of state and any other of these travel that would add up to be above that five so I just wanted to make sure you weren't perceiving that schools are viewing that as that's our cap we can never go above that no they there is no cap in their mind we, if that makes sense Elizabeth have you looked to see how many students meet that cap and go over? Like, is this a huge problem? We have not had have it, anyone go over that, but this, we went through COVID and people didn't travel. So we're seeing more trips being taken. And uh, I, I have not looked at how many are close to that so far this year. Thank you. Emily? I just agree with Scott, though. Why open ourselves up to that? But, I mean, just make a choice that you're going to spend the amount that you can spend. I mean, that's a lot of things past yeah. that amount. Okay, so are we looking for a motion then? And that motion needs to include, well, it doesn't matter what. Did you... Well, if you have a question about hotels, okay. yeah. yeah. Were you going to tell us about the hotels? Yes. Oh, okay. So yeah, since our, our last meeting, uh, it's been originally set the hotel fee per night at $50. We've had multiple uh, programs come to us and say that is not covering their hotel fees for when they go to these tournaments in these towns where everyone is going to those towns and hotel prices are increasing. They're looking at paying sometimes in $300 for a hotel that they're putting four students in. So that's why we went ahead and, and put it on there for the $75 a night. We would add that we would caution them to, you know, charge what they're paying, not just a 75 if they're paying 200 but make it what they're really paying for those student rooms, up to 75 per person. Okay. I'm looking for a motion. Do we need to go to a third read? I guess it depends on what the motion is, right? Okay. But we usually, we have to, we already did the second read, so... And we have to adopt by April 1st. Okay. So, so I'm looking for a motion to adopt. Okay. Um, I motion that we adopt the 2024-25 school fees uh, schedule as listed, but changing the annual maximum p fee per student from 5,000 to 7,000. Second. Moved by Emily, seconded by Elizabeth to approve the 24-25 school fees, um, except change the ax annual maximum fee per student to 7,000. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, um, we did 7.1. So we'll move on to our construction update with Michael Garcia. All right, it's been a few months. I think I missed my last uh, scheduled 
time to come up and speak. So it's been a few months, so a lot has happened. Um, but I will be as brief as you want me to. I'll try to be pretty quick, but we'll be here for any questions. Um, see if I can get the clicker to work. So I'll start talking a little bit about Deseret Peak High School. Um, winter has come, and this is the same as, will be the same thing for Stansbury. Um, it has slowed things down a little bit, it's made it a little bit harder. It's a, a muddy mess, kind of a moat around there right now. Um, luckily, we did get some asphalt paved uh, back in the fall, so it has helped keep mud out of the building a little bit and given a great place for them to park and stage materials. Um, as you can see that the roof is almost done. You can see in some of the drone pictures later, there's just a little bit left over at the athletic wing. The steel um, supply is holding that up a little bit. They were hoping to be done by the end of last calendar year, but um, steel got finished up about three weeks ago and the roof is just about done. Um, a few windows left and then they'll be totally dried in. Um, some exciting things coming in the next few weeks, next couple of, in between now and when I'll report again. Um, a lot of the exterior site is going to get get busy uh, as it starts to get a little bit better weather. They're starting working on the post-tension post um, tennis courts right now. They should, the plan is to the middle of next week get those poured. Um, the bleachers are getting ready to go in in the athletic area and as soon as those are done then they'll start working on the track. The lights for the football field, the bases have been set so in the next two weeks you'll see the lights come up. Um, it's really that's going very well over there. Um, as you see there at the bottom, we're still on track to be done very early next year. They, uh, I think it's scheduled to almost exactly a year from now, we should be totally done. The plan is by this fall to have all of the systems up and running so we have this first winter running to get a lot of the bugs worked out, time to get everything finalized, um, get furniture in. It'll be a big job to set up that school. So hopefully um, this one should be done a little bit before the junior high, give us some time to get a lot of this one done before the, the big push for the junior high. Um, quickly through just a few pictures, um, won't mention much about them, but you can see some of the progress of the sheetrock, drywall, windows going on, um, tile works going on in the bathrooms and the, the halls. And that's just done there in the hallways especially. Just it's a nice clean surface. It's easy to maintain. They don't have to go back and paint it. They don't have to go and do anything that should be fine for you know, decades with minimal work. Um, you can, can see some of, yeah. I am so sorry. No. And I'm not asking it to be changed, but why am I seeing green? So for wayfinding, each of the pods has a different um, color. Oh, okay. For help. So you, anyways, for wayfinding is the biggest thing in the uh wayfinding so they is that I, so they okay. know where they're i know going. i just thought i just yeah. wanted you to describe okay. that to i mean i knew what it meant yeah so but it's easier it's, to explain yeah. that you're in you know the green okay pod. you're in the green pod you're in the blue pod okay right. sorry so you will see um there are different colors throughout in the athletic okay. area and in the the main office and the see the auditorium we you know hit hard with the school colors everywhere else it's just add some diversity and things as well so that's one that's the green pod um, so there's a few other colors around the, the tile and the court and the paint and the carpet all coordinate with that. And like if you've been up to Farmington, they're very similar in that, that they have their colors, but they have some others that help distinguish the pods. Um, some more of that um, sheetrock work being done in the offices, and then that's looking over the commons, and that's that nest um, learning space that we've talked about that's a, a collaborative open space for whatever the school wants to, to use it for. And then one exciting thing also is that's our teen center. Um, you can see that there on the back of the auditorium. This was a few weeks ago. They're just about ready to put the deck on there and they'll be framing that shortly. So that'll get wrapped up. Um, and the timing worked out perfect. We were able to keep everyone on site with very minimal rework. We had to tear out a little bit of a footing in order to get that in, but it was able to to just flow really well and we were able to use the same material so it doesn't look like it was an afterthought. It's really a, a great spot to put it. I think it actually kind of helps soften the, the auditorium there as well. And then real quick, that's the post-tension floor for the uh, downstairs corridor. That'll be polished, I think the 20th of this, 20th of this month is when they're scheduled to do that. Um, it's looking you know, very nice. Hughes has done a great job on that one. Um, you can just kind of see the overall site progress from about a week ago of the 
You can see some of the, the asphalt that's in, some of the sidewalks, curb and gutter. That's one of their big focuses now is the curb and gutter on site and then off site. Um, we're waiting on a few things with um, Tooele City and some FEMA issues with the, the ditch that runs behind there. We're going to submit tomorrow for as much as the road and utilities as we can get approved with the city until we get the FEMA thing cleared. Um, Hughes is ready to go. Um, they're about wrapped up on site, so it would be great if we can get that approved in a few weeks and just let them move from off site onto the road. Um, before I move to Stansbury Jr., any uh, Desert Peak questions? And so Stansbury Junior High, um, this one started about a year behind, but they're quickly catching up. Um, Hughes is doing a great job down there as well. They've, they're working on site utilities. Winter has been a lot harder on this one. The wind has been really hard. We've lost the scaffolding a few days, um, knocked down some walls that were not totally finished. So there's been some loss of time there. Nothing that's worrying them to getting the, the job done on time. <coughs> It has just been a little bit of a struggle and, and kind of a mess. I know they're trying their best to keep the roads clean, um, but it's a really swampy site and it doesn't dry out. Desert Peak dries out really well. That's just kind of the bottom of the valley and it's, it's kind of a mess. But we're hopeful that we can, as the weather turns, we'll get some better uh, on site. Um, let's see. Just trying to look over there. Um, I'll just jump through some pictures. Yeah. Can I ask a question? I get this question a lot. As you don't really notice it if you just kind of pass by it, you can kind of see, but people are starting to say, it looks like it's two buildings with a big space in the middle of it. And then I've kind of started to see it like going together and they're like, what, which one's the gym? Which one's the cafeteria? What are they? Can you just explain yeah. that really quick? And like, so that was a, what's the back? Yeah. I don't know. It's not the back, but I'll just jump to the drone it might help have a little bit of a visual and I'll come back oh a there of it is right there sorry yep that's okay no and so a real quick comment on that I had the uh, this was designed we've learned a little bit with COVID at the time um, so we tried to, a few different things so you have two different structural systems you can see there on the classrooms on the left is all a structural steel system with um, light steel framing on the outside and then there'll be a masonry veneer that'll go on the outside so it'll look the same and then the other block is the gym the cafeteria and the CTE area that was structural masonry the benefit with that has been we were able to have both subcontractors working on the building at the same time and so as the mason got started um, right behind him the framer could go in while the steel uh, contractor was working then as the steel contractor got far enough along um, then the mason okay. moved over to the other area. So we've been able to cut a lot of time off by having a couple of different, have a lot more people on site by, by having two different, um, almost two different building types. But at the end, it'll look like one. But yeah, I've got that, that question too that looks very, looks a little bit different. But um, just last week when we met the contractor, they were very appreciative of that. It, it helped them a lot with their scheduling and giving spaces for contractors to work. Um, They've bumped up a lot of their, their trades just when they had some space available they wouldn't normally have if it was only uh, a single type of construction. Um, I'll go backward just to make sure I don't forget anything. One thing I believe you uh, mentioned, uh, President Rich, last time I spoke was some questions about the road. So this is what the, the approved uh, and the recommended plan by the traffic engineer. It's kind of hard to see. I tried blowing it up and it just didn't really but basically what the traffic engineer said would function is you know, a travel lane in both directions with a turning lane in the middle with increased turnouts onto the junior high site so that they can pull off, which that's kind of what this shows. So it'll be a little bit wider with areas for people to turn into our site, but um, you know, the traffic engineer through their studies um, and we, this was, we went through about a year ago through Erta City Council um, and got this approved on their conditional use. And right now I've been working with and talking a little bit with um, folks at the county to, to talk about grants and some other ways to, to get the road finished uh, off of our property. 
So the front of the junior high is actually the east. So when you're driving in to drop your kid off, you're going to be turning in on the east side of the school. That's correct. Okay. And so there's a east entrance and a west entrance. Is the west where the buses will go? Yeah, the west is the bus, and it lines up with the Stansbury High um, exit. exit area. And you can kind of see in there the turnaround for the buses to get back out. There is a lot of off-site or on-site staging. Still. Um, like if you look, there's, I can't remember the number of cars. Um, you look at Stansbury High, there's very little. That loop in the front is quite small, but we have you know, much more space to get people off of Bates Canyon and you know, for pickup and drop off that we're hoping um, should help quite a bit alleviate some of that congestion. So is that a, a roundabout right there on that west side entrance? just looks like it but it's not no i think it's okay. just the way and this is more schematic from the traffic okay. engineer yeah. it's to scale ish but it's kind of you know drawn with a okay yeah more yeah, again more schematic uh, engineering will get a little bit more detail and actually how it works but this is what the and you can see those numbers on there and i could get you the full report it's it's no, long it's and there's okay. a lot of information but that's their estimated calculated number of vehicles passing through those in a I can't remember if this was the morning, um, which peak, which period this one was. Yeah, that's um, okay. That's okay. great. Thank you. So just real quick, a couple pictures. What they're working on is the site, the amphitheater. There's the gym. Um, and just some more of the, the different types of framing, kind of showing the steel with the, compared to the masonry over here. So that's the CTE wing with some CTE classrooms. And that's kind of a typical classroom pod. Um, I will just say we do have a great bunch of contractors. I went down to try to get some pictures on Saturday to because there's always we have about 200 people working at Deseret Peak at any given time, so it's always people in the picture. So I went down on Saturday to try to get some, and we had about 40 people there, 30 people there at 6:30 in the morning. So they're they're excited to get it done. They're excited to be there. Um, we're just we have a great team on both schools. But any questions on this one or any other projects that I can answer? I will just remind people a few times tonight, uh, it's been called Stansbury Park Junior High. And I remember when we were talking about it, everyone was very specific that it's Stansbury Junior High. So anyways, and then you've got it written here as Stansbury Junior High. So I just, just as a side note, I'm pretty will, sure we named it Stansbury Junior High, correct? Yeah. Okay. And I will so. put a plug, um, Whitney Wallace, the webmaster, has helped me get the website a little more updated. So there's a lot of the same pictures she's pulled from, but there's a couple of drone videos on there. And I did make sure, because it was the same, it was Stansbury Park. So I had her correct that uh, the other day. Because it's Stansbury High School. And I right. think that was one of the board discussions back a few years ago. So anyways, but it is Stansbury Park Elementary. <laughs> so anyways, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Board of Education Committee reports, um, USBA board, JLC. Okay, I, I sent all of you an email. I'm sure you've read it all by now, but uh, I sent you an email of kind of the what they found out at the regional meetings. Uh, it sounds like the, the USBA board is going to set up a new protocol and new operating mode of the JLC or Joint Legislative Committee. Uh, <clears throat> you, you guys that attended the regional meeting knows that there was, uh, there's a little bit of complaining going on about JL, the JLC or the Joint Legislative Committee of how we ended the legislative session. And so uh, instead of being assigned a committee, uh, the entire USBA board will be in St. George on the 25th through the 27th of April, and that will be the entire board discussion. So uh, I was looking at maybe being ill that day, but anyway, <laughs> no. But uh, th that's how that's how it's going to happen. Also, on that email I sent you, there was the additional JLC meeting because they will have a JLC meeting in April so that they can be ready for the delegate assembly in June. So. All right, and then the other uh, committee report is TTEC. I serve on the TTEC board. It is so 
cool to see Tooele Tech and Utah State and our school district working together. They offer so much to us. Um, they are constantly looking for ways to serve our students, uh, make sure our students are able to get into classes while also serving everybody in Tooele County. They really um, have noticed, well not have noticed, this isn't new. One thing that they are really trying to capitalize on is people in Tooele County looking to go to a trade school, a tech school, and they offer so much. And so part of it is just an advertising thing that we focus on for Tooele Tech. Um, but one thing that they do or have done, they do a counselor appreciation luncheon. Because even because if we can get them at the high school level and they're taking the um, – Oh my gosh, pathway classes, but what they're not called pathway classes. Sorry, my kids take them all. I can't think of the name. Anyways, all the classes that they offer for high school credit and college credit or um, certificate credit, um, that is, I mean, they're always looking for ways to collaborate with us. So I think they've done a really great job. They're adding on to their building. So they're trying to, they've been dealing with the legislature as well as far as funding goes. And um, they've been, anyways, if you drive past there, they are adding to their diesel program and their cosmetology program is going to be bigger because of the add-on, the uh, medical tech. All, all of the things are growing because they have the demand for them. So um, anyways, any questions on T-Tech? It's, it's very awesome over there. I, I want all of our students to be able to take advantage of Tula Tech. All right. I am looking for a motion. I'll motion we adjourn. Second. Been moved by Scott, seconded by Bob to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.